Okay.
Ten years? I don't think so. started. Everyone can take their seat. Happy Ocean's Day, everybody. All right. Um, I'd like to kick off just real quick to thank the team that put this event together today. They did uh, yeoman's work here. Adam, uh, take a bow. Donna, Giles, Michelle, um, Thank you all for all the hard work that went into this. I think we have a tremendous lineup. We're going to have a wonderful day together, really learning about all the aspects about sustainability, our oceans, and greening our environment. So it should be a lot of fun, really interesting, and thought-provoking. So with that, I'd like to introduce the president of our board, Commissioner Herrera, who is now serving in his eighth term of Harbor Commissioner for the district, and has been a tremendous leader on our waterfront. Commissioner, you're on. <laughs> And I want to welcome everyone for being here today. Um, the room is a little tight, but I guess it'll serve the purpose for today. Or porpoise? Uh, <laughs> I'll try and scale back the jokes a little bit. Here. All right. I read a lot of them last night. So welcome and thank you for being here today to celebrate World Oceans and Sustaining the Sea Summit. After all, we are the only planet that has an ocean, and we must sustain it for generations to come. It has been used and abused unfairly, apparently, but it is far too long. While it has done nothing but good for us, provided billions of us with oxygen, 
with food, transportation, and according to the United Nations, is the key to our national economy with 40 million jobs. The, de the level of disregard for our ocean has been dangerous, for our fates are one. The Port of Miami is committed to a clean and sustainable environment and ocean. That is why we are here today to learn more from leaders on efforts concerning ocean-based technology, advocacy, and management. Understanding the status and the change in our oceans is a complex issue. When people, are under, when people finally understand how important the, the ocean is to them, maybe things will change. After all, we are all in the same boat, and all we need is water. We cannot continue to neglect the, the ocean and just go along to get along, or, you know, as we say, uh, just follow the flow. We can't do that anymore, you know. As long as there is a way, there has to be a will to change this. And I'm very happy that we have so many people here today that are interested in this and are going to hear from uh, really some quality people. I understand I saw the list of people and we're going to have some great speakers, including Fiona Ma. And she will be here later, introduced by her husband, uh, Jason Hodge. And uh, we also have Board of Harbor Commissioners here today. I think most of them know this. Okay, we have uh, Vice President Commissioner Zacharias right in front of me, okay. And then we have Commissioner uh, Hodge right there. And... Commissioner Rooney's out of the country. Oh, Commissioner Rooney's out of the country. <laughs> okay, well, I just wanted to keep it brief because you have a lot of people with real knowledge to, uh, to hear from today. I also have some other VIPs. I'm not sure if they're all here yet, though. Uh, well, I mentioned to Fiona Ma, California Treasurer, 34th California Treasurer. Uh, we have Congresswoman Julia Brownlee's representative here, uh, but I don't have a name for her. Sorry. Anthony Avila? Anthony Avila? Yes. Thank you for being here, Anthony. And from Congressman Cabral in the 24th District, we have a representative, and that is? Wendy Mota. <laughs> Say that again? Wendy Mota. Wendy Mota is here for uh, for that Congressman Carbajal. And we have Monique Limon's field representative. Do we have a name for her? No, coming later, okay. Um, member Steve Bennett from State Assembly. You're here, sir. Your name? Patty? Okay, Patty is here for him. And uh, County of Ventura Supervisors, District 5. Do we have that representative? No, not here. Well, how about uh, Matt LeBeer? Are you here, Matt? Board of Supervisors, Matt LeBeer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Logistics, we're in the supply chain here. <laughs> well, if I have missed any elected official, please forgive me. Uh, I don't see here. I, well, yeah, Jesse Ramirez was not here, Deputy Commissioner. I thought I saw somebody who looked like him. Mayor Okay. Mayor Martinez is here. Who? Mayor Martinez. Who? <laughs> <laughs> I think Mayor Martinez is here from the city of Fort an important partner of the Port of Wayne. Thank you for being here. So anyway, with that being done, I think I'm going to continue the program. And uh, who do we have next? Thank you, folks. Thank you, Commissioner, for the inspirational words. Uh, so now uh, we're going to call on Commissioner Hodge, and I, I'd just like to note that the Commissioner has been asking me for some time now to put together an Ocean Summit, and we talked about it, and we'd come, and we'd go, and then COVID hit, and we didn't get it done. So, Commissioner, here we are. We did it. Here is your Ocean Summit. Come on up. Your vision is turning into reality. Um, hello, I'm Jason Hodge. Uh, thank you, Kristen. Uh, I'd like to uh, 
I like to be creative in my life. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been a elected official now for four terms for 13 years here at the port. Uh, but I'm a firefighter. I've sat on different nonprofit boards over my life. And uh, my wife and I joke that I'm the uh, negligent father of beautiful orphan ideas. And because uh, I come up with an idea and it works pretty well, like my miniature golf tournament and stuff, but then eventually I'm like, I'm bored with that. Someone else take it. Someone else take it. Um, so, but this is something that was very important to me uh, because. And I was born here on Silver Strand Beach 48 years ago, um, so I have a very um, long history with the ocean. I don't remember learning to swim. I don't remember learning to surf. Um, I walked my dog this morning at uh, you know, 5.30 with a low tide and, and saw the pismo clams coming up because the tide was so low uh, and watched the birds eat it and seeing that amazing ecosystem um, that's right uh, under our feet, yet so often we are ignorant of what's happening to it. And that's why I reached out to Kristen and asked her to start um, this event, uh, which I hope we will continue to be doing moving forward, is because what happens is I'm, I listen to a lot of podcasts, a lot of news, I read quite a bit, and I'm shocked sometimes with the stuff I don't know that's going on with our oceans. Um, the loss of the coral reefs, everyone talks about it. It's not about diving, it's about ecosystems. It's actually about shipping and everything else because those create buffers for, for different islands and shipping ways. Um, everything's interconnected. Uh, one foot of sea level rise is probably going to put my house underwater um, during a high tide and a storm in the next 25 years. That's real. Um, and I actually own a tavern. So I'm one of those two properties. So I'm a little, I'm personally invested in this. Uh, but we all are. Um, anyone that lives near a coast or not near a coast has to be concerned about our oceans. And we're going to take today to kind of uh, move together, have some great panelists, and learn. Um, a little bit of what's going on and hopefully start some dialogues and conversations that we continue after this is over and then you know do more of these in the future. Uh, I'm do something that I absolutely hate that when people do in speeches, but I'm going to do it because I'm going to wake everybody up this morning. Uh, we're going to do interaction. No, no, the stand-up is the worst. I will not do that to people. Uh, little interaction, though. Um, my, my staff always writes me speeches that I never read. Um, but I appreciate them, and uh, I did use some of the high points of it. Um, but let's talk about what the oceans are. I think Jess actually hit them, but, but anybody, give me, give me what, what a use of the ocean is. Transportation, right there, we're a port. What else, what else is it? Food. Food. It, it's literally, um, it's the main source of protein for over a billion people. So, I mean, it's a huge thing. And um, the other thing it is that they wrote down, which I interesting, was it's a buffer um, from foreign invaders, historically. Uh, you know, one reason, you know, they, they talk about the Pax Americana is that as we grew, we were too far away for anyone to really affect us. And I like to think of it, uh, if you're Australia, it's a way of keeping the convicts in. So, uh, how many oceans are there? It's a great question. One. <laughs> okay, he's cheating. I think, I think he wrote my speech. But it is true. All the oceans are a single body, which is the global ocean. But how many oceans now, scientifically, do we refer to as oceans? Anybody know? Yeah, historically it was four. So the seven seas, but the four oceans, uh, which were the Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, Arctic. That's the original four, and now they have what's called the Southern Ocean. Um, which was just, how long ago was that, Giles, when they started actually? Uh, you can try it. In the last 20 years. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. It was, yeah. I think most of us were out of school by then. So so I learned something today. I was like, we actually, because you used to say Antarctic Ocean, and they go, wrong. And now it's like, well, that's kind of right. Um, so it is, but the reality is what it is, it's one global ocean. Um, and, and what you're seeing right now is, Every couple you know, uh, months in a newspaper, you're going to see some weird fish shows up in Santa Barbara. Or something is coming lower than it ever has before. And it's because things are changing. Um, it's reality is, is that uh, climate change is real. It's occurring. Um, and the ocean is where we're going to see a major aspect of it. Not just from rise, but from the change in salination. Um, the change in temperature, which will affect weather patterns, and it's going to affect the patterns of um, the species in the ocean. So, I mean, the fact that we have whales that essentially live throughout this entire planet always blows my mind. Um, but 
for a lot of the, the migrating fish in the different habitats, that is changing drastically. So for us as a port, we obviously deal with shipping. It's important to us. It's, it is our bread and butter. We exist because of that. But that doesn't mean we don't care immensely about the ocean, not just because it's the right thing to do, because it is the right thing to do, but because everything that we can do to make the ocean cleaner, safer, protected also helps our industry. When we do things that are ecologically advantageous, even if it's not directly affecting us, it will affect us in the long term. And that's one of the reason this port is committed um, to just some absolutely phenomenal environmental progress. And, and also, we, we're pretty set on being the, the first zero carbon port in America. Um, I'd like an applause for that. So that's a big deal if you don't know what it means. I mean, we're already well ahead of the curve and ahead of most everybody. You go to many ports and they talk about um, what they're doing for environmental and carbon emissions. And I can honestly tell you, um, sometimes it's, it's laughable because it's a piece of paper. Um, we have won awards year after year because of our environmental stewardship and our environmental progress. Um, we're not perfect. We have, we have a long ways to go, but we'll do it together as a community. So anyways, I want to thank you all for coming today. I uh, hope we all learned something. If you have any, if you want to talk to me or any of our commissioners about what we do, all of us are out there and open for you. Um, Kristen's going to talk a little bit about uh, the port itself today and go through our program. I'll be here all day. Um, please in enjoy your time, and you'll see me again when I introduce my wife. Thank you. All right, Commissioner, that was interesting. I didn't know that about the oceans. Very cool. Thank you. So we just have a couple of quick slides here, just give you a quick update on what's happening at the port, and then we'll roll right into our program. So take this. Here we go. Um, so the port has grown tremendously over the last decade. Where our car goes up about 77 percent. And when we make more money, the good news about that is that we're able to invest more in things like our environment. Um, in terms of stacks, right now we move about $15 billion worth of cargo. We're the number one west coast banana port. You all know this, right? Five billion bananas come through our port. But the interesting thing about that is that it's the most popular commodity on earth is the banana. And if a store doesn't sell banana, people tend to go to other stores. So we serve 13 states that important commodity. Um, we're the fourth largest container port in California, six on the west coast. I don't think people realize how much cargo goes through this port. We actually um, move more cargo than the port of Boston to give some perspective how many containers are actually coming through your local seaport. Um, number 17 container port in our country, number six uh, in terms of automotive cargo coming through your local seaport. And number 10 when you look at us through, I mean the top 10% when you look at us through a national lens. Um, blue skies thinking, we put this up here because this is why we're here today. As the commissioner noted, we are on a mission here to decarbonization. And what we're really trying to do is when we enter this space is to uplift our community with this initiative so that we create inclusion and equity and social justice opportunities in terms of creating green jobs that come with environmental progress and environmental work and green work. Oops, sorry, I jumped a little too fast there. This is a slide that does all kinds of fun stuff. Didn't realize that. So this is um, just a blueprint, if you will, of where we're going, some of the environmental work that we've done. Our commission at our board meeting on November 15, 2001, did sign a resolution or adopt a resolution towards decarbonization. In, in this initiative, we got a $200,000 grant from the California Energy Commission to build our pathway to decarbonization. And in this effort, what we want to do is be very honest with our community. We don't want to throw a date out there that we can't achieve. Some ports are throwing dates out there saying, oh, we'll be completely decarbonized by 2026. Well, we want to have the opportunity to really work with our community, learn what tangible goals are, learn what fuel mixes make sense for us, and then identify funding and opportunities to go forward and meet those robust initiatives. We think we can do it. We do want to be the first decarbonized port but we want to be honest about how we get there and when we can get there. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking um, with the Congressman Carbajal's committee um, and testify on initiatives around decarbonization, <laughs> port electrification. Um, we've invested about $70 million in our port infrastructure. We plug in our refrigerated cargo ships right now, and we just got a $15 million grant between VW 
funds and the Ventura County Transportation Commission so that we'll be able to plug in our automotive ships by 2025 and we're looking at some other technologies to help in that area as well. Something called a bonnet, which is you simply put a hat over the stack of a ship, hence the bonnet name, but it's a, a emission control system that's enclosed to prevent emissions from escaping while vessels are in port. So we're looking at that technology as well. Um, we have electric cranes now that can plug in at our port. Um, uh, so, um, Mr. Bennett was able to land us a $5 million earmark so that we could plug in these cranes. So just a lot of exciting work that we're doing to really green our port. Um, as the commissioner noted too, we were the first port in California to get what's called green marine certification, which is somewhat like an energy SAR certification. So you have to be, meet certain criteria to be able to achieve that green marine certification and you have to improve year over year. We just got our best report card, thank you Giles, um, in, that, in, in that green marine um, effort. So very pleased that we continue to go in that direction. As the commissioner said, there's more to be done, but we're excited to be working as a team with our community to continue on the path towards green um, and decarbonization. And then finally, this slide will be celebrating what our, our customers are doing to be green. There's something called blue skies, blue whales, which is in the channel, you slow ships down so they pollute yet less, because you, when you drive ships slower, they have less emissions, and you also um, prevent hitting whales. So we have customers that have participated in this program, and we're going to be excited to celebrate all the good work that they do to try and keep our, our, our oceans protected. So with that, that's kind of the quick one, two, three, what's going on in Port Bonini, but we're here to try and improve our air and our oceans um, as much as we can with the infrastructure improvements that we make. Um, and with that, now I'm gonna call up Commissioner Zacharias, um, uh, our newest commissioner, but she's out there. Um, I, I bet there's not a person in this room that doesn't know uh, Celine Zacharias. Thank you for joining us this morning. So thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, it's very exciting that the port and Jason with this idea came together and made this happen because I think it's in all our best interest to make sure that we protect all our oceans and our little, you know, mermaids out there, right? Um, but uh, this morning I'd like to introduce uh, someone who is a, no stranger to our community. She's just an incredible individual. I've had the honor to work alongside when she was our state assembly member, and that is Congresswoman Julia Brown. She was first elected to Congress in 2012 and she serves on uh, some incredible committees uh, we've got some veterans here and the veterans in our community have done a great job of working alongside her to make sure that those benefits come to our veterans and uh, that they work alongside for the needs that you know they served our country and they deserve the best treatment that they can so thank you once again to our veterans that are here uh, uh congresswoman brown <laughs> Also, is the chairwoman of the House Veterans Affairs Subcommittee on Health. Extremely important. Once again, you saw our Veterans Center out in Ventura County. That was due to her efforts and her, her committee to get that here, and of course, all our community members that were by her side. She also found is a founder and chairwoman of the committee's uh, the committee on Women's Veterans Task Force. A lot of times, because the traditional individual um, that goes into the, into the military is a male, we forget about those needs of the of our women that are out also alongside protecting them, protecting us. Um, she also sits on the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, where she serves on the Subcommittee on Aviation and Subcommittee on Highways and Transit. Since coming to Congress, uh, Congresswoman Brownlee has been a steadfast, cha uh, steadfast champion of the Port of Wyoming, Channel Islands Harbor, Ventura Harbor, and local airports. She's, uh, through her efforts, our community as a whole has really greatly benefited from federal dollars. So if you see her, thank her, thank her because through her efforts, and I know, like I said, having worked alongside her, she's one of those individuals that if you have a need, you reach out to her office and her office will be on top of those items <coughs> to make sure that we bring the benefits and the resources to Ventura County. Uh, she received the contract of Tower Congressional Leadership Award for Advocacy and Air Control in air control uh, issues, and in 2021, she joined the House Committee on National Resources. And uh, while in the State Assembly, she served for six years on the Committee on Natural Resources, which had primary jurisdiction over air quality, climate change, 
energy efficiency, renewable energy, and coastal protection. So what we're doing here today and the topics we'll be talking about are extremely near and dear to her heart and the importance of keeping the Chura County as beautiful as we have it. We want to make sure we protect it for generations to come. So with that, we have a video from a Congresswoman. Thank you. Well, my work in Washington keeps me from joining you in person on this World Oceans Day. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to the Sustaining the Seas Summit hosted by the Port of Wainimi. As many of you know, Ventura County is home to over 40 miles of beautiful coastline. It's crucial to our well-being and the well-being of our planet that we not take our oceans for granted. No matter where you live, whether right on the coast or further inland, the ocean and the health of the ocean have enormous impact on our lives, especially in coastal communities like ours, where the ocean plays a pronounced role in our economy and way of life. Above all else, our ongoing mission to ensure climate resiliency cannot succeed unless we protect our oceans. For over 86 years, the Port of Wainimi has demonstrated unwavering commitment to ocean sustainability. As a key economic driver in Ventura County, the Port has been recognized as a global leader for its environmental sustainability efforts and bold initiatives to address the climate crisis. As conscientious stewards of the ocean, the Port is leading our collective mission to protect and preserve our abundant marine life and our pristine ocean waters. The presenters at today's summit, including my friend and California State Treasurer, Fiona Ma, will highlight the growing importance of safeguarding our coastal communities from the rapidly intensifying threat of climate change. You'll also hear more about the advancements of marine technology and the potential it holds for the maritime industry including increased efficiency and environmental stewardship. Thank you all for being here and for your interest in this important issue. I look forward to hearing more about the actions and the work we can continue to do together to protect our ocean's bounty and our planet's future. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All right, the coffee's good. I got a couple good mornings. There you go. <laughs> good to know. Good to know. Well, as uh, we heard from our commissioners and our congresswoman, uh, Julia Brownlee, it's, it's, it's going to take a lot of us to come together and make this work. And today, you know, the, the hope and the goal of this panel, of this summit, is to, to give you a small taste, right? It's the inaugural one. So, of course, we're not going to cover everything that we could or should or would on a, on a full, perhaps, two, three-day symposium or, or something of that sort, but we want to just give you um, a, a taste and again to share any of these folks that you've heard from today, uh, they will be accessible, uh, reach out to them, you know, in between lunch, outside a few of them are going to be tabling, and I'd like to uh, introduce someone very, very special that's going to help set uh, our local context for us. That's uh, Julie Tumumai Stensley. She has traced her family lineage to at least 11 known Chumash villages and as far back as the mid-18th century. She has served as a tribal chair of the San Barbeño Ventureño Band of Mission Indians and a member of the Board of Trustees for the Ojai Valley Historical Society. The Board of Trustees and the California Indian Advisory Committee for the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and the University of California at Santa Barbara's Committee on the Repatriation of Native American Ceremonial Artifacts. And with that, I'm going to invite Julie up to give us um, a land acknowledgement and really set the tone uh, for today. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me back there? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, having that knowledge of where half my family comes from. It is on my father's side. 
that I share that Chumash ancestry. On my mother's side, from Guanajuato, Mexico, coming out here in the turn of the century with her family, being the first uh, immigrant people coming and making that exodus out of Mexico. So as we start today, I, I want all of you, I, I'm a storyteller as well, our name Tumamayat comes from our great grandfather, Juan de Jesus Tumamayat. The name means an orphan, one who was raised by his grandparents and learned to carry things on his back. So he takes that social advocacy and environmental advocacy, and sometimes his stories after, after church at San Buenaventura Mission would take three days to tell. And I love that, to be able to have that time to tell stories, and, and you had to come eat to church each week so you could hear the first, middle, and end of the story. So as we can relax into and know that our ancestry, our indigenous life ways for thousands of years, all have stories connected to Nene Shaman, Grandmother Ocean. And we all share that in common. I loved his answer. I was stumped for a little bit. I said, they're all connected. <laughs> and because for us, knowing that water, one of my favorite and most sacred elements in our, in our universe here, is connected. It is the it is the blood of Mother Earth, and and what we see and what is happening in the world today um, is is we all need to be the example and do so much work to help other nations and other parts of the world clean up the sacred body of water. Our name Mekchumash, island people, makers of of um, money, currency. So as we lived and crossed this beautiful stretch of water, as our creation stories have us being created out on a place that we call Limu in the sea, we recognize that our culture scientifically have been here for 13,500 years in a span of 7,000 square miles and those four channel islands that we see today what we are seeing today are mountaintops. As we all know, that was one landmass that over time the waters have risen. So as those people were there on Limu, even before they were there in that place. So we honor, we honor that, that legacy of our ancestors here in this place, Huayneme, resting place, where the Tomo, the plank canoe, paddled along the coastline here. They couldn't go directly over in our channel in Ventura. It was too rough. So they would stop at Huayneme, resting place, before going over to Anpaca, Limu, Wima, and Tucan, where it's traditional. And they're also makers of shell bead money and currency. So we have this long, long history of, of connection here with this land. And so I start my storytelling through my storytelling name, Bear, bear with me. <laughs> and somebody's, somebody's going to have to keep me time. <laughs> but I open up with a creation story as told by Tomas Ignacio from Santa Barbara to Russell Ruiz, there in Santa Barbara, a historian. Long, long ago, Sahipaka, there was Mother Earth, Hutash, out there on Limu. And she had created all these beautiful creatures some in the water, shellfish, some gigantic animals that swam through Pahat the whale. And a few on land, one little snake, a little spotted skunk, some birds, some, lots of lizards. But she was lonely. And she was a little wondering, well, hmm, what am I going to do? I, I really need some company here. Well, she thought about it overnight, and as she woke, now you may be familiar with those little tiny prickly pods that are growing right now on this ivy lung. We call it posh. They call it wild cucumber. It's nothing to do with a cucumber. But in there are these little seeds and some are so dark brown, reddish brown in color. Well, she decided to gather some of these on Limu and she sowed them out into the earth. And as she waited and waited pretty soon, people grew up from the earth, not too tall, very stocky and sturdy in their built, and so beautiful. Their hair was jet black like the raven. And she goes, well, you know, 
I, I created you to help keep me company, but also you, as you move and, and grow in this world out here, you will age and your hair will turn white like the, like the uh, feathers of wit condor. Because there's a little story in this story. Well, as she taught them everything about the island and how to use it and how to be happy and healthy out there, her husband, the sky snake, Sa'ayopa Osh, today we call him the Milky Way. Well, he looks down at his wife and he says, wait a minute, what am I supposed to give the people? Look at you, you gave them everything. Well, she goes, oh, husband, you're clever, you'll think of something. Well, he was very clever because before this gift, the people were happy and they roamed all over the islands. And when the moon, which were kind of still in this little phase of her greatness and her fullness, that they would stay up. But when the moon wasn't there, I don't know if you know this, but there's a giant eagle who holds up the upper world above us, Mishupashu. And when he gets tired, he stretches his wings out. And that's where we get our phases of the moon. She yells at him, get back to work. And so, yes, he'd come back up. And then she'd be her full round self again. But when there was no moon, the, it was dark and the people would go to sleep. But then Sa'ayokohosh, great power inside of him. And as he spits down a bolt of lightning, fire was created. Oh, the people love this gift of the fire. Oh, that all these beautiful, oh, they could keep warm at night. They could bring some of those embers into their homes and, and have a fire always going. I think one of the most things they thought about, ah, oh, no more sushi. Tired <laughs> of raw fish. They could cook their food, and oh, they were so grateful to him. And one of the other things, she was a little angry with him. She said, now look what you've done. You gave them the opportunity that now they're up all night. Because with these fires, they're up all night singing and dancing and partying and carrying on. And all that noise is hurting my ears. i got to do something. Well, it was getting crowded because after all that party and all little babies were being born and the island was not very big and she calls them all up to a high, high mountain sea wolf. Now, in some of our cultures, we have seen over time that much of our sacredness and our, in our um, words and the value that we have to the land were demonized. So, um, you know, Mount Diablo is what is named there out on uh, Santa Cruz Island. But Seawolf means a very powerful big chief. So she brings them all up to there. She goes, look, look what I've made for you. And as the people look across the sky, they go, what is that, Putash? This is a Wishtoyo, Rainbow Bridge. And it's a very special bridge because it's gonna take you over to the land over there. Because you're getting too crowded, you're getting too noisy, and it, it, you just gotta go. Well, as the people looked at that gift, they go, whoa, what are we supposed to do? You're going to cross over. Really? I'm not going to go. Are you going to go? Mm -mm, I'm not going to go. Are you going to go? No, wait, I'm not going. So some people stayed. And as they started crossing over the Rainbow Bridge, wait, oh, oh, people, oh, I forgot. Whatever you do, don't look down. Because you'll fall in the water and ocean, you'll, you'll drown, you'll die. Oh, no, what am I going to do? Well, some people didn't get the memo. They started crossing. They started getting very, very frightened because there was a great mist and fog and they couldn't see the water below them. Started getting very dizzy and they're losing their balance and they're falling into the ocean, fearing their last breath. Oh, yach, Utash, oh, yach. Help, Mother Earth, help. And she goes, oh, we gotta do something. Well, she did. And as the people hit the water, fearing their last breath, they found that they were moving about and around and as they came up to the surface of the water, they go, oh, look at you. Well, look at you. Oh, look at me. And as they had seen, their bodies had fused together. Their legs became these fins. Their arms had become a fin, and their whole body had been transformed. And they go, what are we, Hutash? Says, you are now Alakoi. So, oh, Alakoi, that's really beautiful. What does it mean? Well, it means to go around and about but it is the word we use for dolphin. So they are our brothers and sisters in the ocean. And there's still that I love that you mentioned mermaids because there's also mermaid stories in our, in our culture. Well, everybody that stayed on the islands were very happy. Those that crossed, for some of you, the, the Rainbow Bridge went over to Chismuhu. 
just right at that, the end of the Rincon there, just before you're getting into Carpinteria, there's a big mountain where it steams out to Zbuhu, and they climb down and so went all the way in this direction to Humalewu, where the surf sounds loudly, Malibu. They came a little closer to um, Muwu Beach, Por uh, Point Magu. They also went to Waineme, Shishalap in the mud, where the fairgrounds are. You go further <laughs> north, you go into places like Alawasha, House of the Turtle. You go to Lompo, stag stagnant water. Uh, Pismu, Tar, Pismo Beach. They went inland into Matilha Division, Ahai, Ohai, Moon or Lunar Phase, Sisa or Caesar, and Sespeak, Nikap and Sisa Eyelash. All these beautiful villages that they filled up. It was during secularization that despite everything that happened, we survived that time in the mid 1800s, many not knowing who we were and who we are and how, how we're supposed to know inherently our, our culture. We fight very hard and there's few of us fighting so hard to protect these waters and, and be present. There are times when we've seen these droughts where it's no different. The earth, when we think we are can outsmart the earth and divert water, look what happens. We're watching though, and we're seeing and we're observing the, the, the climates that, that's coming to us. As people prayed in those times of drought, they'd all come down from the mountains over to the ocean and the, and the coastlines, and they were hoping that the people along the coast could help and save them. And they were praying and praying, and unbeknownst to them, down at the bottom of the ocean, out of these crystal houses, these old men would come out. And they weren't really men, they were the swordfish people. And they came out of their house, and they would play games with one another. And they thought, what do you want to do today? <clears throat> I don't know. <clears throat> Let's find the hot, the whale. Well, they would take whale all up from their swordfish bill, and they would toss it back and forth. And one would catch it here and toss it over that way. But every now and then, Pahat landed right on the beach as people were starving to death. We have these uh, famines that went through and people just found this beautiful gift of the whale. Now, for some of you who don't know, we didn't live in teepees. All of our resources were natural. And there wasn't an animal big enough for hides. So they were dome shape, made from willow, uh, tule grass thatching, but sometimes we didn't have those things growing because of the drought. So if you can imagine that beautiful whale not only feeding everybody, and you may go back to Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History where you see that gigantic blue whale skeleton, right? Our main braces of our homes were the ribs of the whale. As you walked in your doorway, it was the jaw of the great blue whale. And for your most important guest, you would fashion little stools out of the big vertebra of the whale. You use the oil of the whale, but you never gathered the oil during a full moon. It went rancid really, really fast. So we watched and, and we had that connection with this. In our times um, that we still, every now and then can go back to, the people would gather. One special place was Thompson Boulevard at the old site of the San Miguel Chapel, and people would come for days and days and days, and they would celebrate, make their reciprocity to all of these people, and all these animals, and all these plants, in a five day, uh, getting ready and preparing for winter. So this song reflects um, that, that knowledge, that reciprocity, and the gratitude and gratefulness of counting on people watching and observing weather, people knowing and having their purpose in the world and excelling in their attributes and their gifts. And so that's what, that's what I pray for, is that we can find in each one of us how we work together within our own strength to fortify and to really be stringent because we really have to be watching and, and really reacting and, and working and I thank you to all of those of you who found that purpose and that strength in working in the government. And when I see pictures of the, the oceans and the, and the rivers in India, I, it just blows my mind. In Africa, there's, there's people now 
pulling together to clean the plastic cell. Here, in this region, um, plastic, mylar balloons. Every day they're pulling balloons out of the ocean. Wind turbines. I don't, I don't want to see our ocean polluted with them. Let's unplug a little. Let's do solar. We can have some, but think about the vertical cylinders, bladeless, because we're trying to protect our whales uh, as well as our dolphins and all that marine life, but we also need to think about the migratory birds, bats, with those wind turbines. And if anybody has the answer to when those break down, where are all the parts going? Is there a um, landfill for blade <laughs> turbines? I don't know. So there's a lot of things to think about when we need more energy. Do we need that type of energy? Yes, because we do need to get on fossil fuel. But let's think of, let's do it smartly. So we have this song, and I think my time will probably be up by then. <laughs> Okay, oh, yeah. let's see if I can get through this. I'm really nasal right now. A healing loss to do. A healing loss to do. something, helping somebody, and at the end of the day, being able to lay your head down to think about your, your next day and your next adventure and how we can be of service, which takes us to Nineveh, the South, that place of infinity. As we talked about, the, uh, the numerous amount of ideas that go through your head, Jason, don't stop, because we all have them. And when we think the impossible, that's when you talk about it and it becomes possible. So as we put our energy out into this direction, Creator, we ask that you give us that place where we can move forward, help ourselves, keep ourselves well and healthy, move into that place of power and service beyond us. Because as my mother always said, when you give, you get back sevenfold. So we look to that place for that inspiration, for that light of fire that gets us going to the West, Motoko, we'll that we always remember our elders and our ancestors and where we come from. We all have these indigenous ways that taught us how to behave in the world that have become fairy tales, myth, and lore, but they are teachings. When you listen to them long enough, they become real and they show us how to behave in the world. To the North, Minwilash, thank you. Thank you, Creator, for the rain and all the cloud people that have come in and is keeping this land moist and, and fresh and clean. We thank you for that. For those that are ill in the world, that you heal them and bring them back into their life in full healthness. For those that are ready to cross over, Creator, we ask that you create and give us that, that energy of the Atishwin, the spirit helper, the dream helper, the power animal, and the power source that we look here for that strength as well. To our sky, Father Sky, uh, the exploration is getting beyond belief. Let's protect our universe, our solar systems, our sun, our moon, our galaxies there. And that's where the mystery is. We need to maintain that mystery. Here, Mother Earth, we are so beautiful. 
it's so beautiful and it's it's unbelievable that we don't think of her as mother for the thousands of years that you have sustained us Sutash, that we need to make amends and move forward for the seven generations ahead of us and to lastly the heart seventh generation that we move in this place of love and understanding and in peace so we thank you to all our relations thank you, thank you. speak on behalf of everybody. Thank you, Julie, for this deep gratitude for gifting us that story and sharing with us and grounding us in that reality of this split, excuse me, this place that we are lucky to call home, that we owe a debt of gratitude and a debt of stewardship uh, to those who came before. And I think that really sets a wonderful tone for the conversation that we're going to be having this morning. Um, we're going to kick off our next panel. Uh, which will be um, specifically talking about the local ocean environment, right? We are incredibly blessed to live adjacent to some of the most dynamic, diverse, uh, incredible ocean ecosystems in the entire world. And to shine a light on that, we're going to look at whales and talk specifically in greater detail about whales. Because whales are these incredible, you know, they call them charismatic megafauna, right? Things like polar bears or elephants, these great... Uh, sort of um, animals that stand for more than themselves. And whales have long been in that role for our culture as clearly the local you know, indigenous people of, of this coastline were in great debt to those whales. That is true up and down the Pacific coast, all over the world. Uh, additionally, stories of like the vessel that we see right out there, the mystic whaler, obviously coming from a time in which our relationship with whales went through uh, a terrible history, and we're coming through that and acknowledging their importance and their roles. So with that said, I want to invite up our first two panelists. I'm going to introduce them as we go forward. First up, Mr. Sean Hastings. He is a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, works for the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, which is a very special designation of ocean out around our base in Channel Islands that's managed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA in recognition of that very uniqueness that we're going to talk about this morning. So Sean, please come on up. Um, Sean helps to handle emergency responses, enforcement, permitting, media relations. He was instrumental in establishing the first marine protected areas out around the islands. Uh, many of you may not know this, but really, ocean protection, creating spaces around the islands where no consumptive uh, activities were allowed, was controversial. That was a, a very painful process to establish those uh, those in, in original areas, and, and Sean was instrumental in that that process. That was what twenty years ago that began. Um, today, he still works on conservation policy, uh, vessel speed reduction stuff with our our great ocean going vessels visiting Waimea and the ports of Long Beach and, and uh, uh, Los Angeles. And then next up, we have Callie Leapart. She is a science, excuse me, a scientist from the uh, Benioff Ocean Science Laboratory at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, and she works on data analysis and conservation science, but has done a tremendous amount of work in looking at the data around whales and ships and trying to share information about that. So with that, I'm going to take a seat, and uh, we will get started. Can you all hear me okay on this one? Excellent. Okay. Well, this first conversation, we are going to be talking about the local ocean here in Wales, as we alluded to. So my first sort of question to the group, and we will jump into our slides at the same time, is related specifically to the ocean here off of the coast of Ventura County in California. Um, clearly, it's a special place. Um, can you tell us a little bit about sort of the, uh, what's unique about this area and this space? And, and how does it, um, does it reflect kind of not only the, the animals living there, but the lives that people lead here on, the, on the, the beaches and coastal areas? And how is it as a unique space as well? Just up. Is this on? OK, great. Thanks so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having us up here. Thank you for the, uh, the welcome. Um, uh, let me use an anecdote, uh, a local story uh, of mine. A week ago, uh, I have the good for 
fortune of counting whales as part of my job when I'm not driving a desk. And um, so I fly the Santa Barbara Channel and I fly over the shipping lanes and count whales and count ships. Um, and it's, it's a very unique perspective on this amazing place that is nationally recognized because of its biodiversity uh, and, and richness. And um, I had, an, uh, after doing this for 20 years or so, it, it struck me that um, we have the American Serengeti here. We have these great animals that thrive in this region seasonally. And um, we counted the first blue whale of the season a week ago, welcomed them to the channel. And um, beyond that one whale, we found 52 humpback whales. So do a little math here, 52 animals, 40 feet long, uh, upwards of uh, 30 to 40,000 pounds each. What sustains a herd of animals like that? It has to be a rich system. Uh, we watch these animals feed on, on um, we call them bait balls, anchovy, schools of anchovy. And it wasn't just the whales that were here. Uh, the, the diversity of seabirds, uh, seals, and sea lions, and dolphin, um, all enjoying this, this rich environment. And so flying over that, um, it's, a, it's a unique perspective that really reinforced these designations that we use um, in law as a national marine sanctuary. We are recognized internationally as a biosphere reserve. Um, and so not just uh, the United States, but the global community recognizes our front yard here as worthy of protection because of this diversity. Um, it stems from the, the, the ocean currents that bring uh, nutrient-rich waters from, from the north and the south and the mix around our Channel Islands, which is why we see these herds of animals move through. Um, lucky are we to have them. Great, that's, that's incredible. Um, can you tell us just quickly a little bit about how that has changed? Is that uh, a high number, a low number? Uh, and then just the, the experience of seeing whales from a plane, how high are you and what is the, how difficult is it to see them? And what is that experience like of, of being up there trying to assess this huge blue ocean up there? Well, I want to share this with Callie, and Callie and I have had the opportunity to fly together um, I don't think there's really a better way to see an animal of that size. Uh, it's wonderful on a boat um, when you see their backs and you see their blows, but from the air you get a three-dimensional uh, understanding of that, of that animal. Um, so the most animals I ever counted in one day was a little over 60. So this was the second highest number in 20 to 30 years. Um, these populations are rebounding. It is a good story. This is not a World Ocean Day where we're going to lay on guilt and we are destroying this world. Um, we do need to do more, we do need to do better, but humpback whale populations are rebounding. Um, we no longer hunt them. Uh, we hunt them with binoculars, uh, and, but no longer the spear. And so it is, um, and yet they, yes, they are threatened by our commerce, uh, by our pollution, um, and we are doing things about that which we'll, we will get into in a little bit. Yeah, do you want to add anything to that experience of, of flying and seeing whales? Yeah, I mean, like Sean, is this on? Uh, like Sean said, there's really uh, no more special way of seeing, you know, not only whales, but the whole ecosystem kind of interconnected there from a plane. Um, but having a world blow to your boat isn't half bad either. So. <laughs> well, I've, I've only had the privilege of seeing a blue whale from a, from a boat once in my life, and it was fairly close. And it, it reminded me of seeing a subway car go by because it just kept going. You know, the whale was turning to take a dive and you just, the whale just kept going and kept going. And then finally there was this massive tail and it just gave you the scale that was, I mean, it's the, the biggest animal that's ever lived. It, you know, it's, it's amazing. So thank you for sharing the, those personal stories about them, um, you know, and that, and that sense of change. Um, we're gonna talk specifically a little bit more about <clears throat> the role that whales play in climate and climate change and ecosystem management. Uh, as Sean alluded to, right, a whale has a big appetite. It's a very, very large animal. It eats a lot of food. It takes a tremendous amount of sustaining productivity in the ocean to produce enough food to feed a whale, let alone 50 whales. 
that means that that underlying, you know, you think back as a, as a child, remember learning about the food pyramid, right? You know, you've got like primary production of grains at the bottom, and then you go into cereals, and then you go into proteins, you know, in a very small sort of corner at the top of, uh, of those meats, etc. cetera. Um, it's probably a very good analogy for that. So things uh, associated with starting with plankton and converting sunlight into food that's happening out there with our phytoplankton. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about not only that process, but also how does that relate to climate change? This is where you're going. You have the scientists on the panel. <laughs> yeah, so whales are what we call ecosystem engineers. Oh, yeah. uh, whales are what we call ecosystem engineers. Uh, really, through their whole life cycle, they really are contributing to the carbon cycle. Um, so I'm just going to say it, whales pee and poop, and through their uh, pee and poop, they have very nutrient-rich uh, nitrogen and iron that are then helping the growth of phytoplankton. And phytoplankton is the base of the whole marine food web. And in addition to that, the way they swim will also carry those nutrients, and that's really important for uh, the nutrient-poor breeding grounds. So we know their feeding grounds are very nutrient-rich, but their breeding grounds, grounds tend not to be so nutrient-rich. So that whole process really helps bring more nutrients to areas that need it. And then the larger the whale, the more carbon they're gonna store. So whales are sequestering thousands of you know, carbon um, to their lifetime, and then when they die and sink, they are not only taking all that carbon with them, they're providing a whole deep sea buffet for those organisms, and then as they decompose, they actually settle into the sediment. So all that carbon stays with them throughout their whole life cycle, so they're not you know, um, emitting it through feeding that. Yeah. Oh, do you wanna add anything about that? So <laughs> one quick note there, um, Callie alluded to phytoplankton, right? You have to think about what that word means. What is the implication of talking about a phytoplankton? Can you tell us a little bit about what that is and what they do? Yeah, so phytoplankton, it's, somebody made a comment earlier about the interconnectedness, and this is, I think, one of the most prime examples of that. So you have the largest animal on the planet that depends on the smallest <laughs> organism on the planet. So uh, phytoplankton require you know, nutrients to bloom. And then from there, it is the whole marine food web. So it's phytoplankton that then feeds the zooplankton, that then feeds the fish, that then feeds the whales, and you know, the sea lions, and so on and so forth. So it really is kind of this whole full circle that's so dependent on something so small. I think that's a beautiful analogy for something that we like to allude to, but doesn't get addressed with quite the same level of attention as you know, a formalized event that we're having here today with lots of resources and elected officials, but talking about the power of the individual plankton to drive this entire ocean ecosystem is an incredible analogy for the power of the individual, you know, the power of the community member to drive change in an ecosystem that isn't out in the ocean but is here on the land, and is perhaps addressing for a community that perhaps has never been heard from before, or has never had a voice in some of these conversations before. And I think that's a, a fantastic analogy for kind of what's happening in the space around decarbonization and around places like a commercial seaport. You know, places that historically have produced burden that are now driving towards change and trying to embrace hearing voices from those that have long been ignored or, or disvalued. Um, and I think that's a very powerful statement. And, and it reminds us that the air we breathe, right? All of these ecosystems that we benefit from begin with these tiny, tiny, tiny organisms that we really all should owe some thanks to, so. I'll just add to that. So phytoplankton, as Marco says they are, they are actually responsible for over 50% of the atmospheric oxygen, and then in turn, suck in about 40% or so of the emitted carbon. So they're really powerful little, <laughs> little guys, yeah. And I think that's a really, really important point. Thank you for making that. Um, we have to remember, Jason alluded to this earlier, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Hodge, the oceans are so vast and so, um, because of the nature of the chemistry of water, and I, I don't want to go down a, a biochemistry and environmental chemistry lesson, but I'm, I'm going to take that path for just a second here. We all owe our existence to a tiny, tiny combination 
um, called a molecular bond that's called a hydrogen bond. And it is basically the connection of a hydrogen atom and an oxygen atom together. And the stability and the toughness of that bond and the amount of energy it takes to change that bond means that water can absorb a huge, huge, huge amount of energy, especially when you get a lot of ocean together. And so what that means is our oceans are incredible buffers in our climate. They keep our, our temperature from swinging wildly. Like if you think about Mars or Venus or some of the other planets in the universe that see an unbelievable temperature swings during a solar day, we don't see that here. And a big part of that is because of the oxygen in the atmosphere, but also that hydrogen bond ocean absorbing that heat. So we have to remember that with climate change, with increased carbon emissions, heat itself, the very nature of energy that we're producing a huge amount of, is being absorbed. The, the ocean is saving us, literally right now, from that heat emergency. And it is carrying that burden for all of us. Not just the heat, but also the carbon piece. And that is driving changes in ocean chemistry that Commissioner Hodge alluded to, but I think it's why there is urgency to this. So I'll, I'll discontinue our science and chemistry lesson with that. Um, should we jump into some of the materials? And Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and um, I, I feel similar um, sense with, with Blue Whale, where, I mean, my, my work is to keep them on the planet. Um, and in doing so, I've begun to realize it's, a, it's saving ourselves, to be honest. Um, because if they go, we go. And so it is, um, and just a quick, uh, Julie, I think your great-grandfather's been reincarnated with Storyteller here. Um, but yes, let's jump into, in addition to seeing these animals the other day, um, there were a dozen ships in the channel and moving our commerce around the world. And, and just for the record, the NOAA, my, my agency, is part of the Department of Commerce. So I have this, this role of trying to maintain vibrant commerce while protecting these endangered animals. Um, we have found a way to do that here. And it is an example that we want to share, that we want to export uh, to other areas wherever these ships and oils go. So what I have uh, long recognized is I can help protect these animals when they're here, but these, these animals have big tails and these other animals have big propellers. So you have the world's largest animal ever to have lived on Earth uh, sharing space with the largest man-made machines on Earth. Um, and they're only here for a short amount of time relative to their whole year. So when they are here, we can jump into what we're doing uh, to um, keep them sharing the space um, uh, in, in time uh, without conflict to either of them. Um, again, the, our program, as, as mentioned earlier, Blue Whales, Blue Skies, is, is working. It is working. And um, we, need to, we need to move this program beyond uh, the Santa Barbara Channel. My colleagues in San Francisco are, are part of this program. Um, our Air Pollution Control, Control District friends are partners. Um, and together we've realized we have a common challenge and it's through partnership that we're, we're working um, to slow ships down um, when we can't separate ships and whales. It's a, the, the easiest lesson with conflict is separate the problem. Um, we can't do that when ships need to come to port and whales are feeding in those same waters. So we slow ships down. It's very, very simple. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for that, that quick sort of description of what we're talking about. Um, I think we're going to jump into a video that talks about the program. And then we've got some slides after that that we'll talk in more detail related to the where and the how and more of Cali's world of, of some of the technology around this and the apps, etc. So let's just jump right into that. Just outside the headquarters of this electronic goods company is the Santa Barbara Channel, home to incredible marine life, including the largest animals in the world, blue whales. But it's also a very busy shipping corridor, and sadly, whales are sometimes killed by the fast-moving ships. Despite best efforts to minimize their environmental footprint, many companies still rely on cargo ships that burn fossil fuels to transport the products we purchase. The Protecting Blue Whales and Blue Skies program incentivizes shipping companies to slow down, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and whale strikes near the coast. 
When we heard about the Protecting Blue Whales, Blue Skies brand ambassador program, we were excited to get involved. Being a part of the Protecting Blue Whales and Blue Skies brand ambassador program gives us a way to be part of the solution. To become a brand ambassador or learn more about the program, visit bluewhalesblueskies.org slash brands. And we put that one up there because the Port of Wyimi is the first port in the state of California that has actually signed on as a brand ambassador with Blue Whales, Blue Sky specifically. And part of you know hosting an event like this is to spread that message, to, to be an advocate for the role that uh, we as a land-based node of cargo, working in conjunction with our carriers, some of who I see in the audience here this morning and who we're going to be giving awards to in a few moments, um, play that critical connection point, right? We're all consumers of goods. It is inevitable and unavoidable in the world in which we all live that we all take in stuff that is made overseas. That's how our economy functions. It's critical to address ways to make that more sustainable, and that's really what one of the major goals of this program is. Um, let's keep jumping through. I'm gonna jump, I think, past one video. And we will get into some of our slides. All right, I'll hand it over. Sean, you want to drive your uh, forward and back or your slides, and we can sure. jump into these. I, I, my preference is just leave a picture of that blue whale, and we can talk about that all day. Um, but to move us forward, um, just uh, real quickly, an overview of the California coastline, and those those yellow and green tracks are uh, ships that we track with their AIS uh, transponders on board. And um, on your right are the three species that we are focusing our efforts on to protect uh, blue fin and humpback whales. The darker blue colors uh, show where we find more animals. Um, and so it's uh, in our little Santa Barbara channel there. My point being, we're just a small stop along the way for these animals and these ships. Um, and you can see where they overlap. Um, and unfortunately, they are hit. Um, not intentionally, of course, ship drivers are uh, eight, ten stories above the above the surface of the ocean, and sometimes five, six, seven hundred feet back from the bow. Um, what you see in the lower right there is a, a fin whale that is uh, draped on. Let's see if we can go back. The whole side didn't come up. Um, draped on the bulbous bow of a ship. The bulb makes the ship more efficient, which we want. Um, it also seems to be a, a, somehow pick up whales along the way. Uh, these animals are hit in numbers that are concerning to us and threaten their survivorship, their populations. As I said, they, they are, uh, populations are expanding, um, but ship strikes and entanglement in, in fishing gear are their two primary threats. We can do something about that. It's our responsibility to do something about that. Um, so what we've done in, in working with our Air Pollution Control District partners in the Santa Barbara Channel region and all the way down to the ports of LA and Long Beach. Port Wayneme is such a natural place for commerce and a natural partner um, in this effort. We create a vessel speed reduction zone um, and it's the same off of San Francisco. These areas also overlap your national marine sanctuaries that are federally designated and protected for all the reasons we mentioned. Um, and we're, we're not asking ships to slow down year round. Uh, it's only seasonally when the animals are here, May through December. Um, and the, um, uh, the Blue Whales Blue Skies program applies to container, car carrier, and bulk vessels, and this year we've added tankers. Um, and we've uh, had fantastic participation. Um, just to highlight here, and we're going to recognize later, many of these companies that slowed their, uh, not just one of their vessels, but their fleet of vessels um, in, in some respects, with the Sapphire Award winners, over 85% of all the distance they traveled in these vessel speed reduction zones um, off California, they slowed down to 10 knots. It's a speed that maintains safe navigation and is safer for whales, and as noted, um, reduces the emissions and thus the pollution caused by, um, um, by the burning of these fossil fuels. You can see here, um, and the, uh, the air districts um, are very impressed with the reduction in NOx, um, and of course, which is essential for our healthy air that we breathe. Um, regional greenhouse gas emissions are reduced. We say regional 
because you see these zones are only off California, not along the entire transit of the, um, of the ships. We don't have time to talk about ocean noise. It is an issue. It is a problem. Uh, these ships uh, generate a, a really, really um, huge amount of noise underwater, which affects the way uh, animals communicate, feed, breed, find each other. Um, and so we need to slow, uh, slow them down, which reduces ocean noise. And then, particular for NOAA, is a 44% reduction in ship strike risk. That's big. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that uh, <laughs> underwater noise piece? Just touch on that a little bit. How does that relate? How do whales use sound? Um, can you give us just a quick well, of that? You know, noise is a really hard thing to, um, as we sit in here and listen to the noise I'm making, um, give you an example. If you go to the Santa Barbara Bowl or your favorite venue for music, um, that music is probably hitting your ears at around 140, 150 decibels. A ship going over uh, um, a whale, the cavitation caused by the prop, billions of bubbles, air bubbles popping, um, causes 180 decibels of sound in the water. Um, these, so you can imagine if we had a rock concert in here right now at 140 decibels, it would be really difficult for us to hear each other. It's the same for the animals. Um, so that's why slowing ships down um, helps reduce ocean noise, which is, uh, get ready folks, in the next 10 to 20 years, it's gonna be one of those environmental challenges. And we're showing with one policy approach, slowing a ship down, you have all these co-benefits, which is why we're so excited by this. Holly, do you wanna add anything to that? No, I think that you made all the great points there. Um, yeah, no, I was gonna say just one quick note on NOx. Again, okay, we're gonna reopen our chemistry box over here for just a second. I know you're all super excited about chemistry. You can <laughs> tell on all your faces. Um, NOx is important because um, how many of us over the age of 40 remember driving into the San Fernando Valley in the 80s, and you'd come over that hill kind of in Chatsworth going down into the valley, and you would see this brown cloud you were gonna drive down into. I remember that as a kid, every time, and it was shocking. And that is called photochemical smog. That is literally a byproduct of NOx. And NOx is uh, it's a, a flavor, if you will, of nitrogen, which is a gas that comes out from combustion of fossil fuels. Well, when it goes up into the atmosphere, it reacts and it turns into that brownish gas that we see. But it doesn't just turn into something that's ugly, brown gas. I mean, no one likes that. Um, it also makes ozone, and ozone, more chemistry, O3, a really, really, really um, badly behaved molecule, right? Super reactive molecule that's looking to mess stuff up. That's what ozone really is. So when you breathe in ozone, ozone goes into your lungs and wants to start throwing some elbows and some, you know, some punches. That is why NOx is really important to control because it is directly linked to respiratory illness and less respiratory disease, asthma, um, bronchial things, COPD, any number of them, COVID, oh my gosh. All of this is linked back to NOx. So some of our friends from the Air District, I see Tyler at the back back there. NOx is a very, very, very important regulatory goal. NOx control is really important for the Air District. And in Santa Barbara County and Ventura County, 40% of the NOx in our air basin that all of us are breathing literally right now comes from OGV, ocean going vessels in transit. The vast majority of those are going inbound and outbound from LA and Long Beach. Some of them are coming here. But that's a really critical element. That's why what we're talking about right now literally matters to when we are breathing air, which none of us are going to hopefully stop doing anytime soon. But that's why VSR matters. It's not just about the whales, it's about so much more than that. I wish Giles was my chemistry teacher. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna keep going with some more slides about some of the work that Cali is doing as a scientist. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I work for an applied marine research group at UC Santa Barbara, and we're relatively new. We started in 2016. And so when we were looking for um, different ocean problems that we could put science and technology towards, 
one thing that kept coming to our attention uh, that was happening in our ocean backyard was this overlap of whales and ships. And so we connected with Sean and his team on the Blue Whales, Blue Skies program and you know, how can we help? How can we take science to help push forward you know, the vision and mission of the Blue Whales, Blue Skies program? And so through a lot of that collaboration, we created a program called Whale Safe. So I'll play the video and then kind of dig into it a little bit. Not sure some of the videos we were having some issues with, so I think we might have to talk through okay. what the features are and what it does. I will talk through the video. Okay. <laughs> I'll just go this way. Um, so one of the missing pieces that we could play a role in was providing near real-time whale data to really give anyone that's out on the water or resource managers more of a snapshot of uh, whale activity on a day-to-day -day basis. And so through that, we created uh, the WhaleSafe platform, which includes acoustic monitoring. So we have a moored acoustic buoy out in the channel, just off of Santa Cruz Island, outside of the southbound shipping lane. And that buoy is able to detect in real time vocalizations of bluefin and humpback whales. And so we're getting that data almost immediately. Um, and then we also um, get direct whale sightings from naturalists and um, community members that are out on the water, when Sean's up in the airplane and looking for whales, all of that data is collected through a mobile app called Whale Alert. And that is all then piped right into the whale safe system in real time. And then to help fill in some of those vocalization and sightings gaps, um, it turns out that the ocean can tell us a lot about the likelihood of uh, blue whales. And so we have this dynamic blue whale habitat model that looks at the ocean conditions on a daily basis and helps predict where blue whales are likely to be. Uh, so weather forecasting, but just for blue whales in this instance. And so we really wanted to make sure that the data was easy to understand and digestible because there's a lot of different species and a lot of different data streams. And so we created something called the whale presence rating. So um, here in California, we know uh, smoke and bear fire warning. So very similar, but for this case, it's whales and it goes from low to very high. And so it's doing a lot of the work for you to kind of understand what the data is telling us. Um, and all of this is made um, public available. Ship captains can type it into you know, their ship however they best see fit. And it just gives you a snapshot of what's happening out in the Santa Barbara Channel um, for whale activity. What kind of, I'm just curious, do, um, I mean, I think all of us have probably heard whale song, right? I mean, it was like that, the, that first um, record that was made back in the 70s of humpback singing it was apparently, I, I had a conversation with a neighbor of mine once who said, um, his like 95 year old grandfather, who was a World War II veteran, um, got a copy of that record and he would sit in the dark and listen to that and he said it was the most calming thing he'd ever experienced. And it was just, it, yeah, I think it, it taps into something very intrinsic when you hear those sounds. Do, do whales sing all the time? Are they singing as they swim or do they sing for fun? Or Can you tell us a little bit about whale noise? Yeah, so the, the singers are the humpbacks. So those are the ones that, you know, Commonly going to hear because they also sing at higher frequencies. Uh, so, for example, if you were to go to Hawaii and put your head in the water, you're more than likely going to be able to hear humpbacks. Blues and fins actually sing at lower frequencies than that. So, by like the naked ear without processing it, you likely wouldn't hear the songs of um, blue and fin whales. So, they, you know, as Sean mentioned, they're um, using vocalizations. Whales' biggest sense is their. You know their vocalizations and so they are here communicating and so we're able to if they're you know I say song for humpback and then calls for blue and fin um, the the receiver will be able to pick that up across the channel um, and so it does have a, a pretty good uh, range and each species has very specific call characteristics so what the system is doing instead of like having to listen to the actual audio files we can look at what we call sheet music for whales. It's called a pitch track. And so just by looking at that pitch track, it's visualizing the sound, and each whale will have its own characteristics of those calls. And so you're able to confirm then which species is you know, making which call. And, and why do the whales sing, especially the fins and the blues, at that lower frequency? What's the benefit of doing that? Well, the um, so evolutionary speaking, like humpbacks, for example, usually the males are singing to attract mates, but here, since they're feeding, we think it's more of a communication tool, not necessarily a mating tool, because they're not here to mate. Um, but we don't know what they're saying yet, so stay tuned. <laughs> All right. Um, any more slides?
guys have we got? I'm trying to recall. Oh, the other part of Whale Safe, um, similar to what the Blue Whales Blue Skies program is doing, is we're also looking at um, all of the speed profiles of the ships. And so this is a nice tool for Blue Whales Blue Skies participants if they really want that dynamic, not only dynamic whale data, but dynamic uh, vessel data. They can also go to the website and say, now, how's my fleet doing? How's this ship doing? And they're getting that um, update on a daily basis as well. So we also provide those on the site. <laughs> All right, excellent. Well, that is, I encourage everyone to go check out those tools online. You can really dig into the details of how that works, both at the scale of uh, a carrier, an ocean carrier, but down to individual vessels. Um, you can look by category. It's a very powerful tool. And it's, it's really about this, you know, this linkage, right, that we like to talk about, that a lot of us think of, uh, you know, a pair of sneakers, they come from the store, or a steak comes from a grocery store. You know, we don't think about those connections. What is behind that process of delivering that convenience for us? And a big part of what we do at the port is to remind folks that it takes a huge amount of work, labor, people, Right, involved in getting that thing to your doorstep, whether it's a new pair of sneakers or a steak or whatever it is, a new cell phone. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of, of ecosystem, not natural ecosystems, but man-made ecosystems working to make that possible. Um, and in recognition of that change, we're going to transition over next to our next agenda item, which is to actually give out awards to the ocean carriers that in the 2022, Blue Whales, Blue Skies program season um, participated and, and slowed their vessels down. So I think we will, let's give a hand to our panelists here right now. Oh yeah, yeah, let's actually, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Let's do some, some questions first, absolutely. So our, our flight profile, we take on a, a takeoff from Oxnard Airport uh, with uh, Aspen helicopters. We fly a fixed wing plane and we fly up the, the northbound shipping lane all the way past Point Arguello. And then we cross over and fly back down uh, the south, uh, southbound uh, shipping lane. So honestly, a pretty narrow swath of the overall channel, but about 100 miles in distance. And those animals were just within proximity of the shipping lanes where we can see. Um, and um, we, we can see across the shipping lanes and maybe a mile or two outside of them. It does make me wonder how many more animals are beyond just that, that region. Um, and you know, if now that I'm, we're, we're back talking about ships, just two things to, to leave you all with. Um, we were recently worked with the International Maritime Organization that governs shipping worldwide. Uh, we have extended the shipping lanes in this channel farther west, farther offshore, past Point Arguello, past the continental shelf. And we did this because that the continental shelf, where the deep ocean basin comes up to what's deep to us, but not deep to whales, um, the Santa Barbara Channel uh, seafloor, is where we see this concentration of animals. We want those ships getting into deep water quickly um, and efficiently, not quickly, we want to get them there slowly, efficiently, um, and through the whale grounds. We also expanded an area to be avoided. So the islands are an area to be avoided on the NOAA charts, um, for good reason, with over 100 shipwrecks documented around the Channel Islands. Uh, the big ships don't want to be near them. And we extended that area to avoid farther west um, toward what we hope will soon be the Chumash uh, Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, uh, because that is uh, with the habitat models that uh, Callie shared, we see, we know and see and model a lot of whale in that region. And the ship, uh, shipping industry has been at uh, the table with us along the way. Um, lastly, uh, just a little le legislative uh, pitch, Assembly Bill 953, currently being considered uh, in California, would take this program that we've shared with you today and expand it statewide. Uh, as I said, we need to um, uh, expand this protection wherever these ships and whales are. And California, once again, uh, is leading that charge, um, leading it even in front of the federal government, who I'm representing. So that is something to keep on your radar.
Excellent. Um, yeah. So have you guys thought about putting these data sets into permission-based blockchain overlaid with the carbon accounting that you can keep a percentage of the revenue to run the program and a percentage of the carbon assets go to the participants? I, I didn't understand really what you just said, but I like it. <laughs> I like it a lot. Um, so you hit on something where um, this is not a sustainably funded program. We did mention uh, that it is incentive based. The, the reason um, this program works, beside the fact of this amazing, very unconventional partnership um, that we've created, uh, is because the industry has uh, willingly slowed down in, in return for a very positive public relations effort and campaign. Um, we are celebrating those, uh, those companies that are uh, slowing down at the higher levels. Um, that PR campaign costs money. Um, we used to offer financial incentives. We would say to the ship, the companies, if you slow down so much, you're eligible for um, financial awards. That, we could have a long talk about uh, paying for conservation. Um, the companies stopped receiving the money. They said, we're not doing this for the money. Yeah. Probably because it was not enough money, really. It, does, it was a paltry amount. Uh, but it did get them to the table. And they started saying, keep the money to keep the program going. We no longer have to offer financial incentives. Um, we want to focus on the positive public relations. When you hear that from a Fed, what that means is, I don't have to regulate you. And I say that very deliberately because we do not aspire to regulate um, this industry. The industry is showing a willingness and a capacity to participate um, in, in return for celebrating what we all know is the right thing to do, which is a, a long-winded way of saying, I would love to talk to you about your idea <laughs> so that I can understand it better. We, it, um, we are looking for sustainable revenue uh, to keep the program operating, which is why you saw the focus on brands. Companies that are the cargo owners are benefiting from this. They don't realize it yet. They're not taking the credit they deserve for putting their product on slower ships. We want to share that credit with them and in return find a financial mechanism to keep the program going. I've heard a lot about um, kelp's influence on blocking ocean noise, or, or, or sorry, ship traffic noise. And I, I, I don't know how influential it is. I was just wondering if, if there is something to that effect. I don't know, okay. actually. Yeah. Um, but I would say where we're seeing whales is not necessarily where we're seeing kelp. So, um, but maybe like more out by the channel. But then the Channel Islands would block. Kelp, I mean, it's, it's been seen as this, you know, magic thing that solves every problem. And so I was, I was trying to understand how influential kelp is in, in terms of that, because I have heard it is a benefit. And that's interesting. Not, uh, we're not aware of the, the noise. I'm sure is that any sort of barrier in the ocean it, it blocks the noise, but also refracts the noise. Right. Um, kelp, as part of the carbon cycle, um, is where we are, the scientific community, is putting a lot of emphasis um, to sequester carbon. So there, and there's a kelp farm that's been placed off Santa Barbara right now on an experimental basis to try and grow kelp. Yes? I just had a question about the noise. You said the whales don't like the noise. So if they hear it, does it confuse them? Is, it, is that why they get hit or do they try to avoid it? Or? So um, some of these individual animals are older than the modern day shipping industry. So imagine an animal that's 80, 90, 100 years old, and here comes something really big and really fast at it, and it has not evolved to, we don't see the animals avoid the ships. And not to simplify this, but for those of you that have cats and dogs, a cat rarely gets hit by a car. A cat recognizes the threat, and a dog stares at the car and doesn't recognize it. These animals are busy feeding, they're here, they come up, they take a breath, they go down, and they feed for days on end. And um, they're doing their business, and they, they unfortunately are doing this in the shipping lanes. Noise, ships, and whales. One thing that we're experimenting with um, by tagging animals in, in proximity to the shipping lanes is 
we think there's actually, um, I forget the term for it, but you know that the loud part of the ship is 800 to 1,000 feet back from the front end, which is where the whales get hit. So we actually think there is a, uh, a zone of uh, quiet in front of the ships where the whales are not um, picking up on this object moving at them very quickly. They can't hear it, so to speak, um, because the noise is on the back end and the dangerous part is on the front end. Very oversimplified. We are still studying and trying to understand why aren't these animals getting out of the way. Um, and honestly, to move forward as someone who's trying to protect these animals, we just slow the ships down. It does give them more time to react. And in the event that they are bumped by the ship, um, they have a higher uh, likelihood of survivorship at a slower speed. Or wouldn't it be good to uh, develop a noise that they mm -hmm. at the front of the ship? If they they're they're big speakers, exactly. right? Yeah, so I hear this. Um, I've heard this for 15 years. Um, we've actually tested this. Um, again, not to oversimplify, but we, you know, we love our songbirds. We put bells on our cats' collars. But who taught the bird that bell meant cat? It doesn't, um, and there's, there is no um, noise that we're aware of that would signal to a whale that that is a threat coming at you. So this is something that we've looked into, we've, we, Noah, have tested, um, and it has proven not to be a viable um, approach where you know, people are investing in technologies like a deer whistle. Um, I, I understand the, the idea, this is a roadkill problem, um, but to, um, noise is, on the front of the ships is not something that we think is a solution. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting idea in world ocean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard. I have heard that Jean Michel, who still wanted to develop and advocate for a sanctuary in Santa Barbara Harbor, is he still pursuing that? Yes. Um, uh, forget it's um, like a whale heritage. Thank you, Kelly. A, a whale heritage site. Yeah. Um, and, and this region is absolutely worthy of that uh, designation. Um, and it, it's not a designation, it, it's a designation that would raise awareness, more awareness. Um, as I mentioned, we have a national marine sanctuary. Uh, we are part of a biosphere reserve. It is worthy of whale, whale heritage designation. Um, and if that helps, again, spread the consciousness of, boy, this is a really important area, uh, we're all for it, absolutely. Do we need another sanctuary like the one up north, uh, Chumash uh, Heritage Site here in the southern? Yeah, off San Diego, I, uh, certainly. I, I think there is reason for it. Um, there's no current proposal or process to designate that region as a national marine sanctuary. Um, in some respects, some of these tools, slowing ships down, um, is doesn't need a sanctuary to do it. Um, uh, where you have high, you know, um, biodiversity hotspots, that is the reason for a national marine sanctuary, which is beyond just protecting whales. All right, well, I think we need to wrap up and move into our next agenda item, which is going to be, well, first to thank you to our panelists up here, Sean and Kyle. We are going to actually be now giving out awards to the ocean carriers who call on Wainimi and who participate in Blue Whales, Blue Skies, um, with particular focus again on that 2022 year, which is the one that uh, just wrapped up and had the data analyzed for. So if I could be joined up here on the stage by representatives from Millennius Wilhelmsen, uh, Hyundai Globus, NYK, K-Line, and Maersk, uh, we would welcome you on up here, and I'm going to go grab the awards really quick. All Here with us today. Um, we have awards for each of them. 
The, uh, the awards have slightly different names because the awards correspond to the amount of participation that their vessels um, participated in during that season, right? Because we're talking about individual ships slowing down in transit. They don't all just own one ship, they own lots of ships. So that's a critical element in connecting what they are all doing is bringing us the things that we all consume on a day-to-day -day basis is that linkage to the details where, I hate to say it, the, the rubber meets the road, the, the propeller meets the water, if you will. But let's jump into it right now. Our first award goes to Willenius Wilhelmsen. In 2022, they received the Sapphire Award level. We'll bring up President Herrera to uh, actually give out the awards. I'm the award here. So, Willenius uh, had an 86% cooperation rate um, for their fleet during the 2022 year. So thank you to Mr. Lenazella here from Willenius. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Next up, we will talk about Globus. Uh, Hyundai Globus, um, they participated during the year at a 52% rate, earning the Blue Sky Award for 2022. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, next up, we have Maersk. Maersk participated at a gold level award of 80% participation in the 2022 year. So we have Jonathan here from Maersk. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And last but not least, um, we have NYK, and they received also the Sapphire Award and had 85% of their vessel transits in the areas at vessel speed reduction and slowed down speeds. So So, um, Jack, good to see you again. Um, NYK has been uh, participating in this program from its inception, and Jack has been pushing this fleet. Uh, they've been right at the gold standard, literally like just a few miles short of the top award. And he keeps saying, like, am I at Sapphire yet? <laughs> and so congratulations, you guys achieved it. Thank you so much. All right, and last but not least, we also have K-Line. Um, Donna will be accepting on behalf of K-Line. They did get the gold award this year for 71% of their transits um, within the VSR speed. So again, we've learned about how these big ocean carriers are protecting air quality that all of us are breathing every day. They are protecting whales that all of us benefit from. They are literally doing this not only for the betterment of their companies, the betterment of our own conveniences as consumers, right? We have to remember all of us are responsible in this space of shipping because we are all consumers of things. They are facilitating that. We are trying to own up to our impacts to the environment that we all know and see and are aware of. And this is a testament to a new model of how conservation can happen without a heavy regulatory fist, but literally a partnership between the government, private industry, the ecosystem, a port. This is an amazing, amazing example. So I encourage you to all, if you have a moment, thank these folks here. Talk to Sean at the lunch hour. Um, I just want to say a, a thank you to all of you for, uh, for listening to our, our talk on whales today. And I think we're now jumping into lunch. Yeah. All right, Adam, thank I'm you. gonna hand the mic over to you.
quick announcement for the group. We're going to get started with lunch in about uh, 15 to 20 minutes. We'll start having tables go back and uh, line up and get some food. But for now, mix, mingle, get some coffee. There's water still in the back. And uh, we'll start calling tables momentarily. Thank you.
Hey, everybody, I can sit down. I feel so casual all of a sudden. It's all right. Can you be in when I'm going to do the introduction for our next guest and speaker today? Um, it was originally in our in our purse, our internal calendar is introducing uh, as Jess Herrera introducing uh, Fiona Ma. But since she's my wife, um, they're like, you probably know quite a bit about her, so you can introduce her instead. Thank you very much for allowing me the honor of introducing her to my wife. Um, so Fiona uh, Ma is the state treasurer of California. Um, she is a CPA, so she's actually one of the few people that came to the job fully qualified. And she has a long history of politics here in California, starting working for um, the, uh, the Senator John Burton, which some of you might know, he's a legendary figure in California politics, um, as a staffer originally um, in the 90s. I don't want to give away her age too much, but it's on Wikipedia. Uh, but then uh, she got elected to the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco, so she was both a city council member and a board supervisor of San Francisco. She would become the assemblywoman for San Francisco for the west half of the city, which is the ocean side, by the way. Well, the ocean, not the bay side. And then uh, she would be elected to the Board of Equalization, which is the tax board, which no one actually knows what they do. Um, and to be honest, she really wasn't entirely sure when she ran for the job. Uh, but by the time she left, she had actually uh, voted to dismantle half of the board. So now there's a much smaller board of legalization. Uh, now she, you know, she is our state treasurer, um, and she is a upcoming candidate for lieutenant governor also. So she has a long and storied career in politics here in California. Um, Prior to our group, one thing that I, I'm going to bring up about her, one of the things that uh, she's proud of, but she doesn't really get much credit for to talk about anymore because it was um, early in her career, but. Um, the original um, bills to ban, is it phthalates, honey? Yes. Yeah, phthalates and plastics. Um, so people don't realize, you know, Feinstein did a national ban, ran it through in the, the Senate, and uh, it got passed. But the first place it got passed was actually San Francisco when Fiona was a board of supervisor. Um, so she had to take on the entire chemical industry to, to get that plastic out, which was truly horrible for all of us. And I don't think anyone realized how much of it was going into our bodies. And then at the state level, she would get the state ban passed, and it would then become the model for, for the na nation. So um, there's actually a book called Who Killed the Rubber Duck um, about phthalates, and she has a chapter in it. So I'm very proud of her for, for that, and that some of her early environmentalism um, was, was, was through that. Um, and also her uh, early work in coalition building, which I think today has been a big theme in that uh, you know, no one is an island to themselves. And as we look at you know, what's going on you know, globally with climate, climate change, um, you know, and just a lot of the environmental degradation and challenges that we have, none of us are islands, and we're only gonna make it through this uh, when we're together, and that's you know, educating each other together, working together, building coalitions, um, keeping those channels of communication. Frankly, listening with a kind ear sometimes, because you're gonna hear things that you're not gonna like all the time. Um, but we're all gonna have to make some hard choices in the upcoming you know, years and decades. Um, and that's one thing that I, I will say about my wife is, um, she's never mad at people. Um, she's never angry at the job. She's probably one of the most bipartisan legislators, not in a voting record, but in her personality. We have many friends on each side of the aisle. Um, everyone has a right to an opinion, something to say, and if you're not listening, you don't get things done. And Fiona is a phenomenal listener. I'm the talker of the family. Um, anyways, uh, my lovely wife, uh, California State Treasurer Fiona Ma. to refer to, but thank you to my husband, Jason. Uh, yes, he is the talker in the family. But I grew up in a household where my dad, I had a tiger dad, and so he was also the talker. And we basically didn't say anything unless he asked us a question. We would just have to sit and listen to him, which at 88 years old is still the case. Okay, he's always like, excuse me, I have a story. Please listen to me. We're like, okay, dad. But, um, Sometimes, you know, they say you marry someone like your father or your mother. So in this case, 
Uh, that is one thing. Um, first off, I'm glad to see that the Banana Festival is back again. I know Jason and, and Jesse really uh, worked on that uh, when it started, really to showcase the port and all the economic benefits that goes through the port. But when you're behind a gate and guards, people don't know what's happening and then they always suspect that something evil is happening behind, right? Those, um, you know, those barricades. And then when you go out there and you see all the families out there and the kids having a great time and everyone giving out the bananas and, um, and you see the cars, then you kind of put two and two together. And I think it has gone a long way in raising uh, the awareness and the importance of having the greenest port here in California, right here in this neighborhood. So growing up, uh, I grew up in Great Neck, Long Island. Any of you from the East Coast? Yep. <laughs> so we used to go to Jones Beach every summer, and uh, my dad had a speedboat, and we would go out in the bay. We would go to Lake George uh, for the summer. I did synchronized swimming, um, and I loved the aquariums. I really didn't want to be in the water, but I really liked to look at the ocean and what was in there. And so when I met my husband, he is a surfer, he's a you know, scuba diver, snorkeler, he does everything in the water. And actually, his nickname is the walrus. <laughs> he is very slow on land, but very quick in the water, and can spend pretty much 24 hours in the water if you allow him. And for those of you who know, if you come over, his office is usually the hot tub. That's where he prefers to do all of his work. So I learned to appreciate uh, the ocean a lot more, just spending uh, time with him. And one of my favorite movies is Aquaman. How many of you have seen Aquaman? Yeah. Not only is he hot, but it, it's, it's, it's a, a wonderful, um, you know, um, like what is happening under there, right? It is just so magnificent and, and you know, there's a whole underwater um, uh, society. And then Avatar, Way of the Water, just came out in 2022. Did anyone see that? Right? I think that that's the best Avatar, in my opinion. Uh, it was definitely the most creative. And one of the stars was this whale. His name was Payakan. He was a Tolkien whale, a spiritual brethren uh, for the people. And again, you know, these movies are so important. Hollywood, the writers, who are on strike right now, are so important in telling our society what is important. And the whales and all of the underworld um, was really in jeopardy. And that's kind of the, the theme of the movie. So all of you who are in here, I'm sure you would uh, really enjoy that. Oceans cover 70% of our planets um, and they need our help because 90% of the big fish populations have been depleted as well as 50% of the coral reef. And we were just in Hawaii, and they have a lot of protected um, areas where they will come and say, you cannot go in that area because of the coral reef. And so it's great that there are so many um, communities and, and uh, people around the world that are really seeking to bring that balance uh, back uh, into our seas. And we need to work creatively, like my husband said, uh, to make sure that we are bringing back the oceans uh, to the uh, abundance and the bountiful um, you know, all the things that they give us that we don't realize, and yet we as humans are depleting it and depriving uh, the oceans, which is important for our ecosystem. I'd like to thank uh, Jason, uh, Jess Herrera, Selena Zacharias, uh, the Port Commissioners, as well as Kristen Dikas, CEO and Port Director. Uh, we were here when you got uh, appointed uh, to this um, position and you have done an amazing job as the leader always stepping up and no matter where we go Kristen Dikas is you know front and foremost and always in a leadership position so thank you Kristen. I was uh, honored to join the California Ports Association for Ports Day uh, most recently and four months ago and also that the governor has done so much in uh, using his position to uh, create these executive orders. And so one of his orders was 30 by 30. 
to protect 30% of the planet's land and water by 2030. And when the governor makes these executive orders, like all electric vehicles by 2035, people listen and it impacts our economy, it, just, it drives who comes to California and what initiatives are being put forward. And then we give incentives uh, to make sure that you know, our um, society is, is, is trying to abide by the goals in these executive order. So he, um, he proposed the 30 by 30 initiative in October 2020, and he has definitely um, stuck to it. Uh, and since April 2022, California has added approximately 631,000 acres of conserved land, bringing our statewide total to 24.4 of land and 16.2% of coastal waters. Uh, he has, again, uh, put a lot into our budget. During COVID, we had uh, massive surpluses, believe it or not, after the first year of COVID, we saw a $94 billion surplus. And then in the second year of COVID, we saw a $45 billion uh, surplus. And so the governor and the legislature, they were really trying to uh, put this money toward one-time uses, a lot of infrastructure projects. You probably saw a lot of roads and bridges uh, being repaired uh, while folks were staying home. But he also um, put a lot of money into climate resilience uh, and sustainability and trying to tackle the wildfire and all that comes with climate change. He has now committed to pursuing a climate bond over the coming months because our budget now is in a deficit position and we're not able to fund all of the things that he wants to fund. But in this new climate bond. Uh, there's going to be proposals for water recycling, salt and sea restoration, community resilience centers, transformative climate communities, regional resilience program, urban greening, statewide parks, sustainable groundwater management act implementation, dam safety and flood management, and multi-benefit land repurposing. So these are just some of the things that uh, could potentially be in a 2024 uh, climate action bond so that we can really continue to uh, push the envelope and move California forward. In this latest revision, the May Revise, uh, it still <coughs> maintains $734 million in investments over multiple years in programs and projects for coastal resilience. And in the water area, uh, it also uh, contains $8.5 billion to bolster the capacity of communities and ecosystems mm -hmm. to endure droughts and floods, because that has been uh, a serious issue. Um, we have been praying for the rain, 10 years of drought, and like 10 years of floods are coming. Uh, and so it's one thing or another, but you know we adjust and we pivot, and that's what California does. And then in, in the transportation uh, arena, uh, there still is $12.8 billion for new transportation infrastructure investments, including $1.2 billion for projects that improve good movement on rail, since you all have a railroad here, and roadways at port terminals, including rail yard expansions, new bridges, and zero emission modernization projects. So these actually will uh, affect some of the uh, port operations here. In my office, uh, we have a number of green projects, uh, green programs that fund green projects. Um, not only do I issue green bonds, and I have to say that the world uh, really likes California bonds. They, um, we are oversold every single uh, round that we issue. We get good rates because of it, but it is a testament to what California is doing and leading that investors believe and want to buy and invest in California. So our green bonds are flying off the shelf. Um, we are developing standards because when I got here, I have to sign a prospectus and it says green bond. And I said, well, what does green mean? And they're like, well, it's green. It sounds green, right? Clean water is green. But as we are advancing, we need to do more and we need to define what green is. And so we have 
uh, put together a stakeholder committee. They have issued the first paper, white paper, and hopefully by this fall, we will have definitions for what a green bond is, and we will be the first in the nation to actually do that. So very, very proud of my office for uh, working on this. We also have the California Pollution Control Finance Authority. Uh, and we have many uh, small business lending programs. Uh, if any of you are looking for some capital, uh, the federal government gave us a billion dollars to put into loan loss reserves and loan loss guarantees so that our participating lenders are incentivized to lend out to small businesses, nonprofits, and, and the likes because the state is going to be the backstop and the state will pay it back. And so right now when bank conditions, uh, getting a loan or uh, a line of credit is, is kind of tough with one of the major banks, please look to my CalCap for small business participating lenders or the iBank also uh, is uh, also a lender of last resort, so to speak. In the past 15 years, we've also partnered with CARB and the California Energy Commission on retrofitting those heavy duty trucks from diesel to more cleaner um, emission vehicles. We are also going to develop a pilot program for ZV, uh, zero emission trucks and infrastructure. And these zero emission trucks include the drainage trucks that enter the seaports and intermodal rail yards. Beginning in January 1st, 2024, only zero emission drainage trucks may register in the CARB online system. So all these drainage trucks entering seaports and intermodal railroads, rail yards, would be required to be zero emission by 2035. And so I know this is uh, causing um, some uh, pain for some of the truckers, but unless we put our money where our mouth is, and really mandate um, you know, that we are all gonna go to cleaner, more sustainable um, emission type vehicles or ships or trains or buses. Uh, we are not going to be uh, combating our climate change goals as quickly as possible. Um, I have another program called the California Alternative Energy and Transportation Finance Authority, CAFA. That's a mouthful, I'm hoping we can change that name to something shorter. But we uh, offer a sales tax exemption for companies that are buying expensive equipment that are cleaning and greening our environment. Um, so this is really going a long way in terms of those sustainable type of companies, biogas production from food waste and dairies, alternative fuel sources for airplanes, solar panel manufacturing, uh, and a wide array of recycling uh, facilities. Right here in Ventura, uh, our agency has um, financed biogas, biopharma, advanced manufacturing, and clean transportation, yielding more than $65 million in estimated environmental and fiscal benefits, including the newest one in Camarillo, Ampere. Uh, they are working on aircraft hybrid electric powertrains. And so even here in this region, you all are um, doing so much in terms of advancement and technology. Uh, the governor also uh, allocated $15 million in sales tax exemptions for lithium, lithium extraction and production companies because lithium is important uh, in the whole EV and battery space. We also issue and offer a bunch of Go Green financing programs, Go Green Home, Go Green Business, and Go Green Multifamily. So if you're looking to retrofit your home or your business or your apartment units and you want to save money, we have very low interest loans with long lead time so that you can retrofit and also save money. And so that has been a real game changer. We financed $60 million in upgrades such as heat pumps, efficient air, conditionings, uh, air conditioners, insulation, and cool roofs. So please uh, look to us if you're uh, trying to uh, uh, save some money on your uh, expenses. So again, we offer a lot of programs. I am the state banker. All the money comes into my office. In 2021, it was $3.2 trillion. Um, I invest the state's idle funds. Our portfolio is about 
$200 billion. And then I issue all the bonds for the state of California, the UC, CSU, and community college systems. In addition, I have 13 uh, different programs, some of them I've named. I also have four savings programs to save for college education, for retirement, for people with disabilities, and our latest is going to fund child savings accounts for kids that lost a parent or guardian due to COVID, and also longtime foster youth. And so this administration has uh, really focused on uh, leveling uh, the playing field, uh, trying to make sure that those of us who need a little more assistance and help in this beautiful state uh, can get it. And I am just very proud that post-COVID, California went from the fifth largest economy to the fourth largest economy. It is now the US, China, Japan, and California if we were our own country. And you have to wonder why. Why? Because of our diverse uh, um, population, our can-do attitude, our entrepreneurs, uh, people who want to just get things done, move the ball forward, and lead. And this is what we are here in California. We are the Golden State, and I thank you all for all of your contributions. Thank you. Yeah, the microphone here. Thank you, Treasurer Ma. That was a, a fascinating overview of really the, the, the way that California is managing the funding related to this kind of transition. So one of the things as a port, right, we're right over there. You can kind of see us through there. Um, we are stewards of this big space, right? People are like, oh, you're in a big parking lot. It can't be that complicated, right? You're just concrete and asphalt. We manage assets that facilitate all of this business throughput, all of this cargo movement, all of these jobs, right? Translating into people paying the rent, buying food, uh, living their day-to-day -day lives in a community that is surrounding us getting more and more expensive. That is really that critical link, but what we're also trying to do at the same time as we're facilitating all of this cargo, the bananas moving through, is upgrading our facilities to address this climate crisis, right? And what we're talking about is, is not simply the equipment, because everybody loves a bright, shiny new tractor or a Tesla-powered ship or, you know, hamster wheel, something, something. What we're talking about is the actual power. Because when you think about what a cargo port does, it moves really heavy stuff, right? We're moving containers of bananas. Each of those containers weighs over 80,000 pounds. Like, I've never really thought about, like, that's a lot of bananas in one container. That's a very heavy uh, unit of food. But it's also sort of an idea of the energy it takes to actually facilitate our economy. And as we've talked about, all of those ships that we spoke about with the whale conversation this morning, the trucks that Treasurer Ma was just talking about, we are looking at the transition of all of these separate ecosystems. Trucks, ships, cargo handling equipment, harbor craft. The state of California is developing rules for every single one of those things. And what's interesting, in each of those rules, they're all sort of built around the same philosophy. And that philosophy is, do what you do, just don't make any pollution while you're doing it, please. That's a big, big ask. That is a huge ask, because we're talking about all new equipment, but here's the tricky part. We're also talking about a brand new fueling infrastructure. And one that is not just in one location like a seaport or at an airport or at a rail yard or at a warehouse. We're talking about all of that interconnectivity. Every gas station, think about that. Think about the number of gas stations we have in our communities. Every single one of those gas stations is a node in a network of fueling that enables our economy and our lives to operate as they do, using fossil fuels. So we're talking about a paradigm shift in infrastructure. Zero emission decarbonized fuels 
being present around our living world with a spatial sort of coverage to let us all live our lives and do our things and have our jobs. That is a massive, massive undertaking. And we have to be very intentional about that process. So th that description is, in a nutshell, kind of what, what I do and our engineering department under our board and Kristen's leadership do every day. We're trying to figure out how do we allow that infrastructure to blossom at the port? How do we pay for it? <laughs> because as Treasure Bond knows, all of this is very, very, very cost intensive. And the other really critical piece to this is Ventura County. Think about the economy of Ventura County. Historically, it's done two products, agricultural products and oil. That has been the history of Ventura County. That's changing, right? Climate change is pushing on ag, and obviously fossil fuel extraction and oil is a, hypothetically, a dinosaur. No pun intended, <laughs> but, it, but it, it really is. We are at a transitional point where new sources of employment, new means of, of insta, you know, invigorating the economy are, are really going to be critical for our future. And the next panel that we're gonna call up in just a moment is talking specifically with a couple of companies that are either based in Ventura County or interested in expanding into Ventura County that are models or examples of what is referred to as the blue economy. And the blue economy is basically saying, we've got this beautiful, huge ocean right here in front of us that we've spoken about this morning, 40 miles of coastline. That space is utilized, right? We have commercial fishing. Uh, we do shipping. Are there other ways in which we could interact with that space in a manner that would sustainably enable economic growth and economic activity? And if you look globally, the United Nations is identifying the blue economy as one of the single largest sort of undeveloped facets of the human economy that will drive sustainable living for the globe in the future. Let's look at a quick example of that. Ships produce a lot of pollution. We spoke about that this morning. There is a need globally to make clean fuels for those ships. A ship burns a lot of fuel. Historically, that fuel was made places where there was a lot of oil, right? South America and the Middle East, mainly. Well, U.S. lately as well, tremendous amount as well. There is a desire to look at could there be global economic equity in addressing the reality that most of the emissions made by the world have been made in what's called the global north? Europe and the US have made the lion's share, and now China in the last 20 years, have made the lion's share of those emissions. Is there a way to create some parity, some recompense for that history by enabling green fuels to be manufactured in what is referred to as the global south? Africa, South America, places where historically they have not had the investment and they've not had the opportunity. A lot of that might be structured around the blue economy. So the blue economy is really, really this exciting space that I encourage all of you, maybe in your Google feeds or if you're ever bored and want to read some interesting stuff, there's incredible papers out there about the blue economy. We're also talking about opportunity that is, well, you know, a little bit disruptive. Companies with new models wanting to do new things. So one of the things our panelists are going to speak about will be needing help. You know, elected officials, people who have their hands on the power, helping to facilitate these opportunities that don't fit neatly into a traditional business model. And that's a really exciting challenge for California. And the last thing, and I'll jump off my, my soapbox, we have very strict environmental rules in California, stricter than anywhere else in the world, arguably. Those rules are put there for a very, very noble purpose. But at the same time, we are facing an unprecedented global crisis with climate change. We owe it to ourselves to facilitate resiliency and response and adaptation to climate change by considering changing some of those rules. And that is a very controversial topic. But as some of the folks here on our panel will talk about, permitting streamlining and permitting realities are going to be a critical part of our ability to adapt to climate change in the next 20 years in our state, and nationally and internationally. 
So with that, I'm going to jump over and introduce our next panel of speakers. So let's get that rolling. I've got my handy little notes here. Give me one moment. All right, first up, I would like to invite from a local company that has a facility to port, um, Harry Rappaport, if you can please come up. He is the Vice President of Operations for Urchinomics. They are a global company that is utilizing the concept of growing pest urchins into an asset to enable ecosystem recovery and basically make delicious seafood at the same time. They are, they are delicious. So we got to sample some the other day and they were incredible. Um, next up, I want to bring up Eric Griffin. He is a founder and CEO of Firm Elements. They are a Central Coast-based organization that is working on developing sustainable means of nutrient extraction directly from the ocean. And he has been an educator for over 30 years, and we welcome him up to the stage. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Andrea Neal. Um, she is the CEO and board member of Blue Economy, or excuse me, Blue Fuels, which is a very exciting new corporation that is developing um, systems to basically look at where our power, where our fuel comes from, right? We have this ecosystem we just spoke of um, relying on extractive sources, and are there ways to generate fuels from things like waste, like plastic waste? Um, she has a Bachelor of Science from um, Baylor University, me, Purdue University, and a PhD from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences in Molecular Biochemistry. Molecular Genetics and Molecular Chemistry. Okay. So, you know, just <laughs> find your stuff. So, does everybody have a microphone? Do we need another? Okay, can we get one more microphone? From the back, where you're pointing. Oh, it's over here. It's hanging. There you are. Um, yes, I absolutely do need that. Thank you, here. Um, let me see what's up there. You can point it that way, Charles. Okay. There you go. Okay. Oh, I think we're out of order here. Well, well, that's the next one, actually. We need to go back to the uh, Ocean Tech one. Um, okay, well, while we're doing that, I want to start off by asking each of our panelists, could you, you know, briefly in a few minutes, describe to me your company, uh, what it does, and sort of beyond just that sort of housekeeping of your company and, and what it is and what it does, how did you get involved in that role? And how do you see your role in your organization as having a nexus with the ocean and sustainability? So I'm going to go ahead and start off with Dr. Neal, and then we'll just work our way this way. So first I'd like to say I'd be really happy to be the CEO of the Blue Economy. That'd be so rich. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Um, although I did recently write a, a chapter of multi-level climate change, so a handbook on it. So um, you can read that. It came out earlier this year. I'm the CEO and president of Blue Fuels. We're a family of companies that are looking at our ecosystems from the perspective of how do we take things like our worst assets, our waste, and things that go in the ocean, and how do we create an economic value for it? So we create things like diesel fuels from waste plastics. We can do transitional energy, direct a, a grid. We can do hydrogen energy from it. Um, and we create this nexus of companies that create that franchise approach to this so we can grow quickly. So our company has the, the tools and the technology, the vertical integration of what we have in the manufacturing of the equipment. We have the fuel production and we're integrating blockchain into this so we can manage our entire supply chain with efficacy of our greenhouse gas emissions. Also what we do with people. So we're overlaying things like impact weighted accounts onto that. We have job development training. So we've started another company to just do job development training and certifications that we're reaching ANSI certification standards for those, for those credentialing processes. So it's creating that holistic environment that's good for the business and does really great for the businesses around us, but also really does well for the environment and for people. Excellent, and can you tell us just a little bit briefly about how you got involved in this kind of company? <laughs> I was an academic, as you can see with very long title, which I never use anymore. Um, but I actually started out of academics with Jean-Michel Cousteau, and he taught me about communication, and I worked with him for years 
um, with the support of all the people around us. But I've, I've quickly realized that even with some of the best nonprofits in the world, it was so hard to access the money that we needed to to do the good work that we wanted to do. So I said, all right, I'm reasonably smart. Let's start businesses. So this is my fifth company. It's taken me longer than it did for my PhD to be a businesswoman. But I'm really happy I've made that transition because I think we're in a spot where we can make a lot of impact. Excellent. Thank you very much. Eric, let's hear from you and from Elements. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I am in education for about 30 years in science and health. And I saw kids in my own classroom after 10 years of not even seeing it getting sick from cancer, diabetes, autism. And then a lot of my family in King City were growers. They were getting cancers. I just could not believe that as a science teacher. I said, no, so I'm going to start studying this. So it was probably 18 years ago, uh, I started studying essential elements and trace elements in the ocean. So our company provides ocean solutions. Um, we're using the ocean and what's in it to fertilize the land. Um, you know, we're water-based ocean, uh, uh, water-based ocean fertilizer derived from the ocean. So basically what we do is if we put our product on the land, we know what happens. It goes in, feeds the plant material, and then it, it moves, ends up in our oceans. Well, it's neutral when you use my product. Uh, it's neutral, and um, actually it's cleaner when it goes in because we filter ours. Mm -hmm. uh, and how did, you, how did you look to the ocean as your source of solution rather than looking to the land or maybe a more traditional source? Well, that's, um, I look to the ocean because it has everything we need. Many people over the last 50 years, including my uncle, who was a farmer for over 50 years, they just think that what they were given is the, is the answer, and it really isn't. We have so much nitrogen, as we heard from Sean and Callie. There is so much water-based nitrogen in this ocean. Phytoplankton, it's out of control how much phytoplankton is there. Uh, the biomass, even the cavitation of the 78% nitrogen when we spray our fertilizer in the air, it binds nitrogen. There's so much nitrogen. And the essential, the 90 essential elements, I think somebody mentioned that today too. We use that. So I turned to that. And then when we started going to growers up and down California, it was working every time. So we have alternatives. It works, you can do it. If you have a lawn, a garden, if you have a school, if you have a city government, right now you can change. You have the alternative to do that. And all you gotta do is look at the website or talk to me, talk to Mark Owens right there, who's education and research, very knowledgeable. And we have a team that will consult all of these areas. And so that's why I looked at the ocean it worked, and it works every time. Excellent, thank you very much. Harry, can you tell us about uh, you know, how you got involved in this role, and basically what does is, what is ergonomics do? Sure, uh, I, I would, I think now yeah. is a good time for the support of it, but uh, just how I got into it. So I, I'm Vice President of Operations for Ergonomics North America. Uh, we're a global company addressing the sea urchin barren problem. Uh, got into this, I have a finance background, yeah. financial services and, uh, and venture capital and impact investing always has had a, a passion mission based around the ocean um, and always wanted to get into some sort of business involved directly in, in trying to change that for the better. Uh, saw a company like this and it aligned very much personally with what I care about, what I like, um, sushi, you know, uni, I, a lot of, of mission-based things and a lot of kind of just delicious things as well. So uh, urchin barons are happening all over the world. Um, not an isolated case in California for the people who know about it here, but what's happening is climate change, pollution, overfishing, uh, so essentially everything that we do as humans uh, that affect the ocean negatively uh, are resulting in the overpopulation of urchins. So they're natural to the various ecosystems, California included. In the California case, uh, 2014 through 2016, there was a, a blob of water, is what the scientists are calling it, that came through. Um, wiped out a lot of kelp, wiped out a lot of the natural predators of sea urchins, allowed them to become overpopulated, and now it flipped the kelp forest ecosystem into an urchin barren. So 
an alternative state of the ecosystem. And so if you go to the, the next slide, what we do is, is we take the empty urchins. And so the, the way that urchin barons work is they eat all the kelp, they have this unique ability to uh, kind of fell the kelp forest, but then remain alive for decades, if not longer. And so, would you call them zombie urchins? Yes, you, you, zombie urchins would be the way that, that we try to get people to get scared of them, really. But um, so th that empty urchin on the left is what they look like coming out of the barrens. Uh, and then after six to 12 weeks, depending on the species, we can use our proprietary process to fatten them up essentially and then sell the uni to the market. And the uni, for those who don't know, is a very high value delicacy. Um, and we're selling mainly to Michelin star, very high end restaurants. At, at Prices that can justify, uh, you know, us paying divers um, to essentially restore the fisheries that have been wiped out because of you know, things like overfishing, but also things that that they're not uh, directly correlated to. And, and can you tell us what what happens when uh, you get out there and uh, remove urchins? Yeah, making my presentation a lot easier. So the uh, <laughs> this is what an urchin bear looks like. Um, can show you countless videos. It's, divers always call it like a moonscape. So this is once a kelp forest where you have kelp from floor to sea surface, significant biodiversity, small predators, large predators, 800 different species at some point in their life cycle uh, spend their time in the kelp forest, whether it's feeding or breeding. Um, and so this is what an urchin barren looks like. If you remove the urchins, the kelp grows back. So if you just flip, you can flip quickly through it. But this is after three weeks only of, of removal of the urchins. And this is after about three and a half months. So you can see very quickly, especially in the California case, giant kelp will kelp grows from eight, 18 inches a day. Um, and so if you remove the urchins, you allow the kelp to actually grow without being predated on. And uh, after a short period of time, depending on the season, you can get really quick kelp and, and, and also predators returning and, and rebounds to the ecosystem. Well, I, I heard a few of you at lunch saying you really wanted more chemistry. Um, you know, they were really excited about more opportunities for learning about how the ocean and chemistry work because we all don't have enough chemistry in our lives. Um, can anybody tell me what the main elemental component of algae, right? Because kelp is an algae. What is it, what is it made out of? Anyone? Right, I think I heard it. Carbon. It's made out of carbon, right? And we have a carbon problem in the ocean. We have too much carbon literally in the water itself, and that's bad because it changes the chemistry of the ocean, but we also have a carbon issue in the air as well. So making something out of that carbon seems like a really, really good strategy for reducing that carbon load. And, and the other piece too is it, it deacidifies the ocean. So the ocean is becoming increasingly more acidic. It's absorbing more carbon than it has in the past because it is a carbon sink. Uh, and that is resulting in making the environment uninhabitable for a lot of shellfish species and other species that rely on a certain level of acidity or, or pH in the water. Uh, without the kelp, it, it's not habitable for those species anymore. And Dr. Neal, could you give us a really quick overview of what acidification means? I'm actually gonna defer to the good teacher here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you've all heard of the pH scale, zero to 14. Seven, right in the middle, neutral, neither acidic nor alkaline. As soon as you leave that seven number, you're moving in a direction of either acidity or alkalinity. And it's essentially a measurement of free hydrogen ions in that liquid or that substance, because it's mainly liquid. Um, anything below seven is an acid, anything above seven is alkaline. Um, as you move further away, it's logarithmic, is it not? It's logarithmic, so it's a 10 power for each of those numbers. Um, but basically what it means is that you are making it harder and harder for a substance that is impacted by an acid to exist in its normal chemical state. Now, why does that matter? I'm sure Harry could tell us all about, you know, what is the foundation of a lot of these ecosystems we just saw the photos of? It's invertebrates. And invertebrates, whether you're talking an urchin or an abalone or a conch or a snail, um, well, abalone are snails, but I digress. They go through early life phases where they have a shell, and that shell is literally made out of a thing called calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate, if you put it into acid, will dissolve, it will melt. So if you have tiny, remember we talked about plankton this morning. We're not talking phytoplankton, because phytoplankton are the ones that have, they're the plants, photo, right? 
fightable, being light. Um, they are the ones making, using sunlight and photosynthesis to make sugars and oxygen. Um, we're talking zooplankton, the little, the next step up the food chain, eating stuff, eating other phytoplankton. If they can't grow, if we take that out of that ecosystem, it collapses. So that's why ocean acidification, exactly what Harry was just referring to, is a really critical, but kind of in the weeds, element in climate change. So addressing that is critical. But let's let's move on to some of our other conversational conversations. Um, I would love to hear, Eric, can you start us off? Tell us a little bit about what are opportunities for a company like yours, being a small, growing company, uh, in this space of sort of the blue economy. Um, you know, what are your challenges like? What are your opportunities? Can you tell the audience a little bit about that? Well, I think we we all know and can see how big the fertilizer business is. Everyone uses fertilizer. And there's a lot of other chemicals that people use. And quite frankly, if you don't have to use that and you can use the natural nitrogen and the essential elements in the ocean, which we've been doing for 18 years, with it not ever working once, it works every time. You just have to educate yourself, and that's your second question. Our biggest challenge is educating ourselves. If we cannot educate each other and then make that commitment to using natural nitrogen, which works every time, then we can't go anywhere. But the possibilities, they're, they're limitless because you know, it's a billion dollar industry, that, that fertilizer, and it's huge. But it's all education. I've talked to well, literally hundreds of farmers over the past 15 years when I talk to them, I just ask them, you don't tell them anything, <laughs> you ask them what they're doing, and then you just listen. And then after you do that, you realize that it is an education business that I'm in. Glad I was in education for 30 years, because we have got to educate people that you have alternatives. It's that simple. So that's the challenge in itself, and absolutely, it's unlimited. It's really unlimited, you know, really finance-wise and any other way. Yeah. I mean, we can we can do it. Thank you. That's great. That's a, a very uh, optimistic outlook on the message, which I think is, is very well received these days. Um, Dr. Neil, could you share some of your challenges and your experiences in that space? So let's talk trash. <laughs> um, the average large municipality brings in about two thousand tons a day of MSW. About 200 tons of that is material that is usable for our industry, but goes directly to landfill. And a majority of that goes to landfill in most communities, let's be honest. So we talk about economics of a region, and we see investments of companies coming in, and that's really important. So a 100 ton per day facility in my industry, that's a $64 million investment. And that's an exact number for the current investment we're making. A $64 million investment, 104 employees with an average wage of about 90 to 95,000 a year. That's a big impact on a community for people who need jobs and not always jobs that are for your education jobs, but jobs that are coming from a general manufacturing standpoint. Raises the level of living for everybody. So big impact, diversion of these assets from landfill. And when you talk about industries like ours that use paralysis or combustion systems, you're looking at about 50% reduction in greenhouse gases compared to almost every kind of incineration system out there. So you're saving on greenhouse gases, you're creating a lot of jobs for people, you have a lot of investment coming into that community, and you're reducing your impact overall on the environment. Additionally, when we think about our overall impact on the environment, about 15% of our global greenhouse gas emissions are gonna go by 2050 to our plastic going to landfill. That's nasty. So we've got a way to also have an asset that you know, people don't like to talk about. We don't like to talk about our trash, but it's an asset. And it's an asset we should be harvesting like gold. And we should be transferring that asset into these new energies. So right now we're addressing it through marine grade diesels, which has a really great marketplace. But we have the opportunity to make sustainable aviation fuels. We have the opportunity to take that hydrogen Production. We have the opportunity to take direct to energy grid. 
And not only does it do those things, but it creates those resources close to home. So you are being impacted by the regional, um, the regional grids. You can have things that are off grid. You can have um, energy that's available during disasters or energy that you can divert in different ways. So I personally love trash. Please give me all your trash. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate that. Like it makes me appreciate trash in a new way that I haven't previously, perhaps. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe some of your challenges? You know, how, what kind of, uh, what, what's been an obstacle or what's been a, a hurdle to overcome? So we as a company, when we're looking at a site or we're looking at a development, one of the biggest things that come to us is what is the state offering us to bring our business to that state? And unfortunately, California, which is my state, doesn't give me very good offers. That's really sad. You have, there's a lot of problems with permitting. Um, now there's precedence that organizations and companies like mine in the conversion space are going to have to go through CEQA. This is a big burden on us as a company. It's two years or more in that development process, which is a barrier to entry into the market. Finance structures, more partnerships with municipalities, that's fantastic. Ways to come up with creative financing that allows us to have usage fees and things like that that go through the companies with the municipalities. Great way to do business. We love that. But incentives, permitting, even expediting that CEQA permitting in county to county would be extremely helpful to companies like ours. And all of that time, time going into a development, the longer that development period is, the longer we have to waste money on those things, it takes us out of the business in that region. Excellent, thank you. That's a great reality check on kind of what it actually takes to put these things on the ground. So, Harry, I'd love to throw that same question to you and hear a little bit about your outlook on that. Challenges. And, and, and opportunities. opportunities. I, I think opportunities is, is kind of self-explanatory. It, it, it comes down to collaboration, which I think is a real opportunity in California specifically. So I'm working in Eastern Canada, California right now for our, our work, but uh, we have operations in Norway and Japan as well. Um, and it, it just seems like the California case has interested parties up and down the coast. The problem is spans you know, beyond just the U.S. border to Mexico and up into Canada as well. Um, so there just, there seems to be a, a group of motivated individuals that are willing to cooperate. And I think cooperation is a real opportunity beyond all the positive benefits that come from our business succeeding. Um, you know, we're an aquaculture company and we're, we're trying to use our business model to restore the environment. But I, I think that aquaculture, first of all, you know, it's, it's really limited by like two factors a lot of times, uh, financing and regulation. So from a permitting perspective on our end as well, I think the port has been really helpful in that regard. Um, we've had you know, aquaculture, permitted aquaculture sites across the state of California specifically are, are not easy to come by. Um, there's infrastructure involved, but essentially really you need the ability to pull in water, operate, and then discharge water. Um, in our case, we're discharging cleaner water than the water that we're pulling in. We're putting it through a set of, of RAS or recirculating aquaculture system filters that can, can filter out a lot of the particulates and, and get it cleaner again than, than when we brought it in. Um, I forget where I was going with that. Uh, I guess, I, you know, so those, those, those sites are, are hard to come by. Um, the port has a permanent aquaculture site. We're leasing land from them, and, and, and honestly, it, it saved the day. In, in one way, we, we had a site identified in Northern California, Bodega Bay, uh, struggled to be able to navigate the regulation around it and had to scramble and, and find an alternative. And, and luckily, we're able to um, occupy a, a lease that, that had a, a recent tenant that moved out in the port, and it's been pivotal for our operations. Um, so from a regulatory perspective, though, expanding that, identifying new sites, trying to get a new site permitted is, is really complicated. Uh, and then second, financing. Um, Treasurer Ma, I, I, I wrote down a few of those programs that you have. We'll certainly be looking into them. Um, it, it's a CapEx intensive business. You need recirculating aquaculture systems, but systems as well, as well as site upgrades and just the ability to control the environment, which is not easy and, and not cheap. Excellent. Well, thank you for all of you for sharing. Yeah, Eric. Jones, I want to just give a concrete example. I realize I didn't do that. Let's take one acre of strawberries. We have one acre of strawberries cost about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to grow those strawberries for a farmer. He uses fertilizers, pesticide, herbicide, fungicide. 
was about five months to six months. You can use ocean elements, we're doing it now, for a blueberry and a strawberry farmer in Santa Maria. He's elated, because now he's spraying next to his dog, doesn't matter, you can spray this stuff. Like it's like ocean breeze, but all those, all those uh, phytoplankton and cyanobacteria and algae, all those elements, all that nitrogen, there is plenty of it. Probably costs at least half. We can do it for five thousand to ten thousand, based on how many times we've grown on that one acre, as opposed to fifteen or twenty thousand. So you're saving money. No more chemicals in the ground, and what you're eating. Is totally organic. It just it can be done. We have the alternatives. So what I'm hearing, a common theme of sort of um, we, we kind of touched on it in the intro, but but disruption, right? Doing a new model, doing things a new way, questioning perhaps the method through which things have been done previously. Um, some would argue that this is a, a necessity of climate change. That we have to break the old models and come up with new ones because we are clearly deficient in managing um, the ecosystem writ large with the, the economy as we do things now, right? We're very extractive, very wasteful. But that's just where we're at. So I'm, I'm excited to hear more about this. So one of the, the themes, and, and here I'll pose this to you first, is that uh, there's questions from some parties related to um, human-based intervention in ecosystem recovery. That is, in some, some quarters, kind of a controversial topic. But at the same time, recognition and the reality of the, the severity of the climate crisis is saying that we have to, we have literally driven off the road when it comes to a species. We can't let the ecosystem recover on its own accord. We have disrupted stuff so severely. We need to actively intervene. Um, I'd love to hear, and, and any of you can chime in, but I want to start with Harry. How do you see your company's role, or how do you how do you feel about uh, actively being involved in ocean conservation and climate conservation through your company's operations? I I, I mean, my personal theory on, on why the urchin banner problem exists in the first place is just the fact that intervention um, is it's necessary at this point. That, you know, climate change has pushed us further away from normal kind of day to day condition. Um, the, the urchin barrens and, and kelp forests, they flip back and forth all the time. It's, it's a natural kind of change of the ecosystem. In our case, we need to intervene because it's gotten so intense. Um, I, I, and I think, you know, in this case, purple urchin specifically, so the red urchin fishery is the popular one here. Uh, purples have, have not been commercialized historically, and I think that that lack of balance as well. So I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking me on that. No, that's good. I just wanted to sort of hear of like, does your company have a philosophy on on that? You know, how do you address those questions of, are you trying to profiteer from from ecosystem degradation? You know, how do you address that sort of concern to those those corners? Yeah, that, that's a fair question too. I, I I mean, what we're trying to do is is take a portion of the proceeds that we make and have that fuel for the restoration. So we're putting an artificial price on the heads of these ecologically destructive urchins. They're valueless. Um, the, there is a market price for a full urchin out there. None of these have that value. And so what we're doing is monetizing those empty, valueless urchins through our business model. I, you know, we're not a silver bullet. We're not gonna solve this on our own. There's, there's other factors, other interventions that can occur. Uh, you know, Kelp replanting, predator reintroduction, ways to improve the environment, but it starts with removal of the urchins and the ability to actually get some sort of this, this keystone kelp species back so that other species that rely upon it can actually thrive. So it sounds like you're saying like put out the fire, you know, at these locations by removing the urchins and then now that the fire's out, you can enable some of that ecosystem recovery to actually happen. Right, kind of, kind of, really what we say is we're nudging nature in the right direction. We're trying to just get it to the point where it, it can start to go back to rebalance and then you get urchins feeding on that kelp and, and a little bit more full, you can reintroduce, someone was talking about otters before, you can in, reintroduce predators into the ecosystem to feed on urchins that actually have some sort of benefit to them. Uh, and then, you know, as that expands, the, the, you know, further restoration can occur. So once upon in my life, I was an explorer and I led over 9,000 nautical miles of research in open ocean on microplastics. 
So I have been to the most remote places on our planet and looked at our impact on it. And ever since I've done that, I've wanted to figure out how do we fix this? And there's lots of organizations that are doing things like, let's go scoop up all the plastic in the ocean. Well, that's not really realistic since we get about 90% of our oxygen on the planet from our open ocean environments and from our planktonic species that are on the surface. There are avenues of doing that, like picking up big derelict nets, but it's also just a smidgen of what we produce of trash every day as people. So I started to look at this problem of, okay, I don't want to go and disturb our environment. I agree with picking up the big things that we can pick up, but how do we deal with the crux of the issue, which is we've got a lot of waste that we're not using. We're literally throwing it into the ground and covering it with soil. So I feel hopeful and excited about our industry. It's growing 28% a year. I feel excited about making tools that other people can take up the reins with so that we can start harvesting our own trash and making energy from it. And I feel this is the wave of the future. And hopefully, in the near-term future, there will be a day where I become completely obsolete. And then I'll be really, really happy. But until that day, I'm going to be treating every piece of trash like it's gold. And it's going to be my gold. <laughs> it's going to be my partner's gold. And that because I've made an economy around this, because we've made a true value asset out of something that everyone throws out into big pits and covers it up, is something to be really hopeful about and really excited about. Love that. Thank you. Um, I wanted to actually pose another question to you, Dr. Neal. You spoke earlier about the ability to produce a variety of fuels. Um, how do you see that, or do you feel as though there's a, um, a perhaps a lack of clarity for the public, general public, when it comes to, well, first off, sort of what is a decarbonized fuel, and then sort of secondly, won't there just be one that will just do everything perfectly? Um, how do you see that sort of uncertainty in the marketplace, both places like commercial seaport, but also aviation, um, municipalities like duty vehicles, right? How, what's your, your experience in that and, and your sort of thoughts as we, as everybody's trying to leap forward in this space? It's complicated. <laughs> That's an easy way of saying it. It is complicated. Um, not all systems are equal. You have older scale paralysis systems out there that maybe only have 50 or 60% recovery of carbon. Our system does 90 95% recovery. Um, we're very particular about our feedstock, which is our plastic or our tires or our bio that comes in because the industry is dirty in, dirty out. So we have to be very clean about what we put into our systems. And even on the back end of our unit, so the main product we make, which is a paralysis oil, it doesn't break it down in the chain links enough to be direct usable as a road grade worthy product. So for instance, you could use it as a diesel additive. So we had to have a hydrofracking system that breaks those carbon chain links down even further to make it into roadway ready products. But even on that back end, it gets more complicated. So we can go direct to say um, Jet A, which is, a, which is a jet fuel and it has like a light compound. But then you're not using all of your product because you have a heavy fraction that comes off. Or you can go into say, um, 100 LL, which is like a low lead um, aviation fuel. Well, that's closer to what we have and we lose less of our product, so it's more of a market entry kind of decision from a business standpoint. Marine grade diesels are a really important part of what we do, and you're right. These are very expensive vessels, and if anything goes wrong in those engines, they've lost a lot of money. So they have to be very assured about the product that goes in the bunkers and that's gonna be running those vessels. So a lot of testing, a lot of efficacy on what we're putting into that product. Same with cars. Can you imagine if like 100 cars filled up and all of a sudden they all broke down because it wasn't working in their engines appropriately? We'd be toast as an industry. So every single kind of fuel product that's out there has its own set of regulations. It's complicated across the board on how you're gonna enter it into the marketplace. Um, so it's complicated. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, and I think that's an important message because one of the things we struggle with in being regulated and in being a port that has a lot of stuff going on 
is, is an understanding of what is the future going to be. You know, there is an expectation from a lot of the public to say, well, just electrify everything, right? That's the answer. That's where the state's going. Let's just put batteries and wires into everything. Well, it takes a very long time to fill a battery. It takes a very heavy battery to power a piece of equipment with enough energy to work even a single shift. The, the answer on the short term is not going to be a single solution. It's going to be a variety of solutions from a variety of different sources of energy. Um, and I think that's something that's attractive about uh, sort of what, what we're all talking about here today, which is that you know the, the, the solutions are not going to come from one simple cure-all. We're going to have to be coming at this from you know multiple directions and, and multiple uh, angles. Um, I want to leave some more time for some Q&A at the end from the audience. But my last question for all of you is basically, as we are talking about the ocean today, um, would you be willing to share or talk about a personal experience, a life experience, perhaps a career experience, that either happened in the ocean or on the ocean, perhaps, in Dr. Deal's case, and her thousands of miles of sailings, um, that was instrumental in sort of you know, your commitment to wanting to work in this space? And I'll open that up to the floor as, as any of you wish. I guess I'll start. Uh, I'll default to, I have credentials in science and health. I'll default to health because when you get 90 elements in your body, you heal yourself too. And what, have I, what I've experienced is growing food for so many years for people and friends of mine. They feel better. They look better. And actually things have happened where they've said, I feel better. I just feel like a... And then whatever they say, they notice the changes in their own body. I think we're healthier. And I can go into it a lot more later, but I default to health. The health of our kids, get the fertilizers off the schoolyards. The health of our you know, community, get the fertilizers off their yards. The health of just everything. And so my personal experience is I started seeing that in my friends and family and all kinds. Probably the first four or five years I started getting elements into my food, all 90 elements from that ocean and that natural nitrogen in the food. You are healthier and the plants are healthier. So That yeah. sounds amazing. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Neil, Mary, do you want to? I, for me, I mean, it's not really work related, but growing up around the ocean, surfer, swimmer, everything, you know, uh, wanting to be at the beach at all times. Um, I, I just remember early on in my life swimming and getting absolutely clobbered by a wave. It just, you know, body surfing and tumbled around to the point that I didn't know if I was gonna make it back to the surface. And I'm sure a lot of people who have swam in the ocean have felt the same. Um, you, you just feel the immense power of something that is beyond your control uh, and, and you, since then, I've always had a passion for understanding it, harnessing it, and, and trying to you know, work with it. Um, you know, then, as through work, I've identified kind of trends and, and things that just make sense to me. Um, I think kelp, for one thing, makes a lot of sense from supporting biodiversity, supporting ecosystem. Um, the other piece being aquaculture. Uh, the world needs to be able to farm its food to, to feed itself, uh, otherwise we can create lab-grown meats and, and all these new alternative ways to, to get the, the necessary nutrients we, we need. Um, but in the end, you know, cattle, pork, chicken, all these terrestrial agriculture crops or, or animals are, are widely farmed, whereas with fish and seafood, it's, it's widely still wild caught, generally, still hunted. Um, so there's this just growing macro trend of the need for aquaculture to, to sustain the world and saw many things, you know, benefiting the ocean, benefiting the world that, that kind of got me into what I do today, but also just generally the ocean space. So back when I was a baby grad student, I was really, really interested in demo sponges because they created these long chain methoxy fatty acids that came from a relationship with the sponge and microbial communities in the sponge. And I thought that was really fascinating. Can you tell us what kind of sponge we're talking about? Um, so a really good example of a demo sponge are the orange puff balls that you see on the coast here. They're a demo sponge. Um, 
So I went on an expedition into the Florida Keys and I just got my scientific dive license and I was really excited to go diving in the Keys. And the expedition leader at the time, the PI, he's like, this will be the best dive you've ever done. It's the most pristine coral reef. It's amazing. So we get down and we dive down 70 feet onto this reef and it was gone. There was nothing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. It was completely gone. It was devastated from human runoff. <laughs> yeah, I, I can appreciate the, the change. There's a yeah. very important concept in ocean conservation um, called shifting baselines. And it's basically the recognition that within our own lifetimes, our own generations, ecosystems are changing so quickly, we lose track of what it used to be like. If we speak to our elders who maybe lived here at a time when there wasn't as much pollution, there wasn't as much runoff, you would see, I have spoken to, to people who have lived around this, this coast their whole lives, and you talk about big animals, things like uh, giant black sea bass, right? This is a ocean fish that lives out on the Channel Islands that is literally almost the size of me you know, upwards of 600 pounds. Um, I saw one as a grad student diving out on Anacapa um, in 2001, and the, I saw this cow-sized haze, and it honestly terrified me, because I assumed it was a shark, and then it came a little bit closer, and it was literally the, just this giant fish that was as big as I was that kind of swam up to me and was like, are you food? No. <laughs> They almost went extinct. They literally were wiped out as a species and have only recently begun to recover. But that is an example of, of a nice story in that space. But we're losing track of those intergenerational stories about what these spaces used to be like. And things are altering so quickly. If we talk about kelp, right, since the blob, Harry mentioned the blob, and the blob sounds melodramatic, but it's very real. This was literally. A, a pool of warm water that sat in the Pacific Ocean between Southern Alaska and Washington State for about four years. And it was essentially driven by climate change in that when water is different temperatures, it's different densities. And very warm water and very cold water do not mix particularly well. The warm water sits on top of the cold water. And what happened was that entire geographic ecosystem relies on temperature differences to drive mixing. Mixing of the cold and the warm water. And that mixing makes this beautiful booyah base of nutrients and life that sustains the entire Pacific ecosystem between Alaska and Baja, California. That functionally shut down for about four years because of that warm pool of water preventing winds and winds drive the mixing, right? It's like blowing across, or blowing across a hot cup of coffee. You're stirring it up. That's what the winds do. And there's no winds. It doesn't mix. Those nutrients don't mix. Everything dies. What Dr. Neil is sharing is, is examples of things can change very, very quickly. And in relation to the kelp, the north coast of California, if you go north of the Bay Area, there are stretches of coast up there that you can find photographs of where as far as the eye can see, you see a carpet of kelp. And that kelp sustained an ecosystem that was a richness beyond our, our wildest imaginations. Giant abalone and huge wolf eel and rockfish of, of massive sizes. Fish that can live, they estimate, to like 200 years. Fish that were around before Europeans showed up on the coast that are still alive in some of these places. And think of the stories that fish could tell. The same thing with coral-based ecosystems, probably where Dr. Neil was, was diving. You know, coral is not a single individual. It is a family, an aggregation of thousands of individual organisms working together to make a living organism and work as a team. Um, kind of a powerful analogy for what we've been talking about today, but. I just want to mention, when it comes to shifting baselines, just to put some numbers behind it, Sonoma, Mendocino County had a 95% reduction in kelp forest coverage over the course of a few years. 
Um, and so now you see news stories about the kelp is bouncing back, and it's doubled in coverage from the year before, but it's doubled from 5% of what it was you know, only a half a decade prior. Um, so it's just people are starting to use baselines to create a good news story, for example, but it, it requires fast acting. Um, you know, it, these things can happen very quickly, and you need to be, I mean, in, in a lot of cases when it comes to blue economy, a small business is able to be nimble enough to try to address those changes as quickly as it can. I've learned, you know, coming from the investor side and on the operator side, it moves much slower than I would like. Um, you know, financing, regulatory change, support from politicians a lot of times is, is really where you're gonna be able to get that help and, and move as fast as you need to, we need to. Yeah, yeah I think that's a great message and a great theme. Um, let's go ahead and open up the floor to some questions from the audience here. Yeah, sure. sure. So you've taken urchin out? We pay fishers to. And then put it back in? Or no, 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 they're, they're done once they, once they come to us. Uh, so we pay fishers to go out, harvest the urchins like they would normally, except they target specifically the empty ones, mm -hmm. uh, which they would never do otherwise. And then we rehome them in our land-based systems. So the zombies. The zombies, yeah. And then we essentially fatten them up. So we'll, we'll take them, and because they've already grown up to that adult stage, we can fatten them up over the course of two months. And then we will send them to a processor, process them ourselves in some cases, and market that product to, you know, once you crack them open, they're done. I'm, I'm going right after this if you want to join me. All right. Yeah, welcome to it. Yeah, doing exactly. the same thing. Uh, so our feed is Japanese. Um, we, we use Japanese kombu kelp, so kelp for human consumption. We use the waste product of that. Uh, there's a lot, it's big industry in, in the Eastern Hemisphere, and so we're harvesting the waste product from the, the Japanese, Chinese, Korean kelp industry, using that as our main ingredient. Um, and our feed is, is really our key technology. So we have a proprietary way to take kelp, turn it into what looks like a piece of dog food, and that can hold its form in water over the course of a couple days. Urchins are notoriously slow eaters, and so what they can do is they can nibble on a really nutrient-dense, flavor-dense kelp feed that then results in a really great product. Do you have to use our feed? We, we get our feed, right now at least, I was talking about this with somebody earlier, we get our feed from Japan for now. Uh, it, it has a shelf life of six, to, six months to a year, um, so we can get a lot of it in bulk, store it on site, use that uh, for now. I, I think over time we're gonna wanna try to source locally and be able to produce that locally, um, but it just takes time to find, it's really the right inputs and then also the right manufacturers. Is it spore for us? Uh, no, it's, uh, it, no it, it, I mean, they eat the urchin spores or the kelp spores? Well, they're spore We're not bringing the wild kelp itself, we're, we're bringing um, the, like the actual formed feed already. So it's in a pelleted form. There's no kind of, yeah, there's no reproductive capability of the kelp at that time. We can talk about it more. Can we buy farm elements in stores? Or can we get it from online? You get it from me, and you can get it right outside this building in about one hour. Oh, cool. But how do you sell it? How do you sell it? Like through the internet? No, you call me and you make you place an order and then I speak to you and tell you how to apply it. We do have a quality control plan. We also have an element quality control group of people. One of the experts is right here on the table. And then we have a water expert, irrigation expert, uh, much two or three more. And then we consult cities, counties, anything to use the product properly. All right, let's go here in the blue shirt. I'm going to repeat the questions because we do have an online audience, so I want to make sure they can hear these too. For Dr. Neal, so I fill up my garbage bin. What's going to get combusted and turned into the blue, blue fuel? So the question was, what uh, what parts of the, the your typical typical garbage. Uh, typical garbage load would actually get utilized by your system? So. We, we work on very specific kinds of plastics, so LDPE, HDPE, polypropylene, and then we're also developing um, and bringing from Europe a tire conversion system. Um, 
And that's a really good question. We can't think, take things that have chlorinated compounds in them, like PVC. It doesn't do well in combustion engines. So we have to be very careful about the products that go in. From your municipal waste, it depends where you are on how they, they do it. In places like Florida, it all goes to landfill. Here, they at least sort out what has a marketable product. But most of the plastics that come out of your MSW don't have a market and the market's too low. So then it ends up in landfill, even if it has a recyclable factor to it. So the idea is, can we create a marketable product that creates a streamlined approach for this value add asset, enough that it will incentivize everyone to create these modern MRF systems and provide us the feedstock we want. Can you tell us a little bit what an MSW is? <laughs> so basically MSW is like your mixed waste coming in from, from people. And so it'll go into the receiving facility and if you have a modern system that's gonna recycle it and, and sort it, it will start to sort that out. Many places in the US, it just goes direct to landfill, either um, a hole in the ground that they dump it and then cover it with soil or in places like Florida mountains where they, they stack it high and then cover it with soil. Yeah, I had a friend who lived in Southern Florida and his father was taking small plane flying lessons and their main navigational point was the highest elevation location in Southern Florida, and it's a, a landfill. All right, we had a few more hands. I want to make sure we get to everybody. Yes? Uh, my company makes uh, IoT uh, or RFID uh, or solutions for monitoring and making visible characters, making visible the data characters. And as part of that, uh, we've worked closely with Wild Cotton in Alaska, as well as with Oval Markets in Greece in Aquaculture. And so right now we are part of all the traceability initiatives that are coming out for CP. That's the first part. And in doing that, I discovered that 60% of the farmed fish coming into the United States of eaten is coming from China. And when we look at what our pilots are going to do, we're, we're partnering with IBM, and what we look to plan what our, our partnerships are, we're very good in the wild crop, but we're in the United States, and how do the aquaculture, you know, how fast can aquaculture grow here, and, and vice versa can help. So the question was around the, uh, the need and the, the growth related to aquaculture, pointing out that, um, and this ties to what Harry was talking about earlier as far as the difference between um, seafood being a widely, largely wild sourced protein versus most others, poultry, beef, lamb, etc., being farmed. Um, you know, where is the, uh, some of that coming from? Um, I, I know the stat that I knew five years ago, I'm sure it's changed at this point, is that 90% of the seafood that we consume is imported in the U.S. Okay, so, and, and I know that, it, I think it's, it's pretty much flipped in China. Um, they farm about 90% of their seafood. Regulation is a really critical piece. California has a significant amount of coastline. It is notoriously tough to navigate aquaculture regulation in the state. Really? Um, it's the, I mean, there's five different groups that oversee a given swath of coast, coastline that require, I was saying, intake operations and discharge. So you need the ability to install infrastructure to actually pull water from the ocean and then discharge it back. Uh, and then you need the ability to actually operate and have trucks going in and out, you know, deliveries need to occur. Um, so there's you know, commerce that needs to occur on a very valuable piece of land that's hard to achieve in a place like California. Uh, so it's getting reformed. I, I think it, it, it will take a lot of time and a lot of times it's, it's a, battle that you may lose. The estimate that we have is about $500,000 in five years to get a new permitted site, and that is an indeterminate outcome. So it's not an investment that a lot of companies want to make. The classic, uh, kind of the quintessential case is that a company will set up shop in California, they'll see how hard it is, and then they'll move to Mexico. Um, and then, sorry to all the politicians here to, to say you know that it's a tough situation to navigate, but. I think it, it will change. Uh, it will have to change at a certain point, and there, you know, maybe California will eventually have to take tabs from other states. In, in this case, to be able to get the right permitting involved, one piece that is really exciting. Someone was talking about this kelp farm um, off of Ventura County. Uh, 
federal waters is, is a really exciting, you know, open water aquaculture in the ocean is an exciting way to, to try to leverage, you know, kind of space that is been historically unused. In our case, we're using land-based recirculating systems. At a certain point, those systems should be complex or sophisticated enough that we can do that totally closed. So we don't need to be tied to the ocean. We could find a warehouse in the middle of nowhere and truck in water when we need it, recycle pretty much all of it. Um, and, and the technology is getting to that point. I would say it's probably there in some cases, but a lot of times for, for um, you know, downside protection to be tied to the water and be able to have fresh water is kind of a necessity at this point. There is a very good example of an inland seawater farm called RDM Shrimp in Indiana. And they do saltwater-based shrimp, and it's a total recycled system. They do it in a natural eco-based system inland in Indiana and they are a major supplier for shrimp to the major hotels within Chicago. So they're, they're a great example of what you can do with inland saltwater shrimp. Do you know what they make? Do they make their own water? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that, that's the other thing too, is you, you, can, you know, aquariums make their own water a lot of times. You can use it in water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Remind me never to eat shrimp in Chicago. Yeah, it's <laughs> like some delicious in the air of this trip. Real quick. Um, and, and as one of the politicians in the room, uh, uh, what is, for each of you, what's the biggest challenge or the one thing that could change for you individually with what you're working on that would help you when it comes to, especially anything that involves our steel job? So the question was from Commissioner Hodge, what is the one thing that could be changed from state government that would help your company? Take action right now after this meeting and go get some water, use it. You'll be a believer, because it'll turn your product dark green, whatever you put it on, and change, because it can be done. And so that's the biggest thing I'm dealing with, is once again, just education. I mean, one person, my company, we're certified in 12 states west of the Rockies. And so right now, this summer, I'm going into Arizona, Texas, Colorado, and Nevada. Got a salesperson in each of those areas. It's just education. So that's the one thing I would say. Education and for people like yourself who do have the decision making power, make the change on just one little thing. One school, just the landscaping around your office, and then you'll see it that it can be done. It's been done. This ocean can take care of itself. It's so nutrient rich can also take care of the land, put those nutrient-rich elements on the land that does the same thing, <laughs> same way. And I have one question, then I'll leave it to the other folks here. The rainforest and the redwoods, do they need chemicals? Do they need fertilizer? They don't. They get that foliar application of the 90 elements of the natural nitrogen almost every day, and that's what it looks like rainforest and redwoods. And so we're just recreating that with our business. And then now we got to educate people. So uh, for ours, it's a very specific type of permitting that becomes an issue. Because of ISCC standards, which is what all the major companies in the oil and gas industry want your fuel to be designated ISCC plus certified, we have to have our material be designated as waste. When our material is designated as waste, we sometimes get categorized into a transfer facility permit process, which is at least two years of CEQA or more. That becomes cost prohibitive in our industry. We're really a manufacturing facility. We should be designated as a manufacturing facility, and it shouldn't require CEQA from that perspective. Not that we're not obeying and managing all of the environmental permitting rules that we can, it's just the process of going and coming into the state of California with that immediate hurdle of being a transfer facility is cost prohibitive for us. So, and cost prohibitive for all of the companies like us. I, I'm gonna say two, one is, is probably one that you could achieve very quickly. Uh, I think resources on finding financing, both grant financing and, and loans. Um, loans, I'm definitely gonna call, but uh, I, from a grant perspective, I mean, free money to enable research, early stage research, and allow us to take more risk at an early stage of business development it is, really valuable, it allows us to answer a lot of really expensive, critical questions at an early stage of development. 
Um, and then from a permitting side, uh, you know, in our case, I would say as a regulator to learn more about the potential of aquaculture and the state of where it's at, talk to Department of Fish and Wildlife, talk to the Coastal Commission or, or you know, I mean, Department of Fish and Wildlife would be a big one, but just generally get a, a, an understanding for how aquaculture has been held back and the amount of value creation and, and, and economic growth it can result in. Um, when properly supported, uh, you know, examples would be there's there's blue parks that people are trying to create or have created. Uh, in Kona is a big one. They have a, they install. You know, it's, it's really if you build it, they will come kind of mentality. They built a very large deep water pipeline that pulls really nutrient. I don't know if it's nutrient rich or not, but very cold fresh water from the deep ocean into an aquaculture park. Okay, so it is yeah from from the specialist, um, and so th that allows. Uh, you know, companies to come in and, and have the one thing that they need to, to enable operations. People are trying to do that everywhere. San Diego has done it to a degree, um, not as much for aquaculture, just because I think they have environmental factors that they have to deal with. You know, there's open water stuff, but from a RAS perspective, it's a little tougher. We've been talking to them. Um, Fort Bragg's trying to do something as well. So there's, there's governments across the state that are trying to create these parks or try to enable Blue foods, blue aquaculture, uh, but it, it's uh, you know it's, it's a long yeah. slog. Both of your examples there have federal involvements too. Like San Diego has a large federal component. When we talked to them when they started their their project about four or five years ago. Um, I haven't updated in a while, but for Bragg, same thing. Even with us, there's things we can do with the military that we might be able to do faster because we can do things there without some of the same regulatory hurdles. Um, but so I mean, so here are some regulation. Funding, really, some classification education amongst policymakers or yeah, and there's cases. there's a lot of um, terminology within the current legislation that's incorrect for the industry. Okay. So that also creates hurdles that shouldn't be there. So even just the terminology of paralysis or gasification, they aren't labeled correctly in the state legislature in, in California. So you know, those create these unrealistic hurdles for us when we go for the permitting process. Um, when it comes federally, we are well below any of the issues for air emissions or quality control that way. Like we're not running into federal issues on the permitting process or even issues with air emissions locally here in California. The, the main spot that we got stuck with in permitting was with CalRecycle and it was designation of our facility type. And that becomes very prohibitive depending which way it goes. Funny story, really quick. I remember when we were registering as a business, there was no option for shellfish aquaculture, or I, I don't think even aquaculture generally. Uh, so we had to register as a chicken farm. And then eventually we were able to. You have like one chicken out there? <laughs> just, just, just qualify. Yeah, sea chicken ranching is really <laughs> All right, well, I want to thank our panelists. Uh, that was a great conversation. I really appreciate your candor and your, you know, honestly, your, your earnestness in, in committing yourselves and your careers into this space. I think that's admirable. So thank you from, from half of us. Um, thank you, the audience, for listening to that one. I think we're passing the mic to Adam over here, and we're going to jump into our, uh, our next panel. some uh, amazing individuals that I'm fortunate enough to call friends and hope they uh, consider me as, as one as well. Uh, these two uh, amazing individuals have done a lot of work here locally in Ventura County and throughout the Central Coast as a whole, and some in other countries. So without going too much into detail, I'd like to invite up Mari Paz. Akobo from Coastal Keepers. Let me just give you a little little intro to Mari Paz, who she is and what she does. 
So Mari Paz is a first-generation Latina college graduate from Oxnard, California. Born and raised in Oxnard has given her the tools and community to succeed in every aspect of her life. She's a graduate from Cal State Channel Islands, where she earned her BS in Environmental Science and Resource Management, and BA in Chicana and Chicano Studies. She's worked as a congressional intern, an environmental intern for the Ventura County Watershed Protection, and she also worked with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, restoring habitat and monitoring western monarch butterflies. As an environmental intern with the Port of Wainimi, she has gone and done amazing things, and she'll be sharing some of those with us today. So she currently serves as the STEAM Transfer and Retention Coordinator for students at CSUCI. And during her free time, Mighty Paz is an active member of multiple local community organizations. Uh, one which she'll be sharing on today is Coastal Keepers. She's a co-director of Coastal Keepers, an environmental organization focused on advocating for the betterment of coastal ecosystems and the local community throughout Oxnard through beach cleanups and ocean education. In her role, she has founded many new opportunities for collaboration and boost coastal accessibility and education to the community of Oxnard. So Maripaz, thank you for joining us today. And next, I have Rocio with the Merito Foundation. Rocio has a BS in oceanography and an MSc in marine resource protection an extensive experience in areas of ocean research, conservation, sustainable tourism in US, Mexico, Korea, Japan, and Scotland. Rocio adapted the medical program to Southern California from NOAA in 2005 and directed it until 2013, when she co-founded the Medico Foundation. She has reached over 10 million people through ocean conservation outreach projects, immersed 15,000 students on earth and ocean science issues, and has raised the capacity of more than 300 teachers 100 marine protected area practitioners in the areas of ocean science, resource protection, in the past 12 years. So she's an avid scuba diver, loves to see the world, and advocates tirelessly for an inclusive and diverse new generation of environmental actors. Let's give them a hand. Well, thank you both for joining us here today. And uh, well, I may know and be very familiar with a lot of your work, uh, I'd like to first uh, kind of learn what, what, what initially drew you uh, to this. I know Giles asked, um, you know, kind of a question to some other panelists, you know, what was that, that first kind of inspiration or, or moment where, where you, you know, really had that opportunity to connect with the ocean and, and money thoughts, I was curious if you'd, you'd like to share that with us. Yeah, thank you, and I want to say hello, everyone. Hope uh, you're all still awake with us. I know lunch uh, was pretty filling and very delicious. Um, but thank you, Adam, and thank you, Rocio. I'm honored to share this floor with the two of you, uh, knowing the work that two of you have done in our community and worldwide. Um, but growing up, uh, like Adam was mentioning in my bio, um, I'm from Oxnard, born and raised. I've been here my whole life. I think I was only outside of Oxnard, living somewhere else, probably for like three months. That was when I was in DC, and that was probably the only time I've left. <laughs> um, but growing up, uh, you know, I went to Sierra Linda Elementary, um, I went to Fremont Middle School, I went to Oxnard High School, and it really wasn't until I was at Oxnard High School that I really got exposed to the natural environment, right? Um, the beach is 10, 15 minutes from my house going down Gonzales Road. Um, and, you know, growing up, I never really saw it as a place where I can go hang out, learn about these different things. And it wasn't until, um, you know, I got interested in high school with AP Environmental Science. Um, a lot of kids talked about, oh, it's an easy class, you know, for, if, for college and we want to get in, the AP test is super easy. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. Like, I can do it. And so, you know, I went in with this mentality of like, oh, this is gonna be an easy A, I just need this for my college resume because I'm trying to get in somewhere. But my teacher was super impactful. You know, he talked about, he did all this traveling around the world and learning about different ecosystems and learning about the ocean and how it contributes to our well-being. And, you know, it's just this great big body of water that contributes to our everyday lives in ways that we may not notice, that I started to gain an interest in it. And so from then on, you know, 
Um, he did offer us a trip to the Channel Islands, which I also didn't know existed until high school. Um, unfortunately, I was sick and I couldn't go. Um, but I finally made it last year to the Channel Islands, which I was very thankful for because of Coastal Keepers, right? Um, and, you know, that experience in high school kind of just was this catalyst for me to continue with environmental education. And that's why I decided to go in at my uh, Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science. And you know, from there, um, I met a bunch of really cool people during my time at CSUCI, which I'm forever thankful for. And um, one of the founding members, Rafael Ochoa, uh, we worked at the same place and he, kind of had this idea at the beginning of COVID, it was December 2020, and I remember he texted me, he was like, hey, let's go out and clean the beach. Um, unfortunately, I was very wary about interacting with people, so I didn't really go until like a couple months after, but I saw the momentum that he was building, and I was like, this is something I wanna be a part of, because you know, in Oxford, you don't, you don't really see opportunities like that come up, especially with people who look like us up here, right? Um, were typically not the normal narrative that you see in environmental movements, but knowing that it just came about through community and friendship and wanting to make a greater impact, that all of this started. So that's kind of you know how I found my way in falling in love with the ocean, falling in love with the natural environment, and also you know just relying on my community and my education that has led me here today, thankfully. And look at where we are today, right? So thank you, thank you for your insights and perspective. I'm gonna come back to a lot of that. And, and you did mention the Channel Islands. And Rocio, I think you're just, what, hours from coming back from the Channel Islands? A day. A day? Yesterday. Yeah, we were uh, yesterday with students camping at Santa Cruz Island. And we had also 45 students aboard that tall ship right next to you. Oh, Eight graders from the Asa Middle School were um, sailing for the first time and learning marine science with a nonprofit that is working with the Maritime Museum, COA, Central Coastal Ocean Adventures, I think it's. So, uh, yeah, we have, um, hearing you is like, um, that's precisely what our, we want to do. We have more, more young people like you wanting to take their part in ocean protection and give me more opportunities, but I'm about to do that. Yeah, and, and similar to Mari Paz, when, when did you find that, that connection with the ocean? When did you have that, that aha moment? I'm really old. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was born and raised in North Mexico, Chihuahua. I'm from Cabo Country, Cabo Country, Vaqueros, Chihuahua. There's a uh, closest ocean is 780 miles away. I grew up uh, with uh, cows in front of my house pulling their tail. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> when my, I was 11, my father and my mother divorced. And I think my father wanted to distract my sisters and I took us to a trip to Cancun, which is very far from Chihuahua. And uh, that was it. I was hooked. I was supposed to study to be a doctor. I always, well, I, I heard my mom say that every day of my life. But then, um, I purposely flunked the test so that I could go to Ensenada, which was 800 miles away in Baja, Mexico, to study oceanography. And I rode the back of a truck from El Paso, Texas, to San Diego, San Diego to Ensenada, to do the test to see if I was admitted. And I was 17, 16, almost 17. And that was, I started, it said oceanography, physical oceanography. Um, so I worked in research. I went different than the night gentleman from research to business, ecotourism, then to what do we do now, which a lot is the foundation is education. So totally different. Yeah, right. and, and to bring that back, I think um, you really hit it on the, the what do we do now, and you know, kind of looking at the panels, you know, we had three breaking into simple sections, you know, every good story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I think I'll bring this back to the, the what, the so what, and the now what. We're gonna get there, because you guys are doing amazing now what kind of stuff. But something that I heard that was really uh, interesting that you both spoke about was uh, the importance of education. 
and engagement. And there's a lot of different ways that I think we all you know, have heard today how people get, get engaged with the ocean, how they connect with the ocean. It's different for everyone. Um, so how important is engagement, and we'll you know, use a broad umbrella term, um, for stakeholders? Because it could be anyone from a student, it could be someone like my boss, or someone like myself, or someone in this room that, you know, maybe this is the closest they come to the ocean, they don't have a beach you know, within walking distance, or there's these other barriers like transportation and things that keep them away, or they just simply don't feel comfortable because no one looks like them at that beach. So you know, how, how is it that you find ways to uh, create that connection with, with a variety of stakeholders or so what, what, what have you found um, you know, as, as, as successful um, in, in your day to day? Well, because I had that route from being in research, bolted to a computer, analyzing data, hydrographic data, and, um, and I felt um, that the research wasn't doing much in like not enough people understood it the way, this is a long time ago, right? I graduated from college in 1991. So I went through that to then ecotourism and exploring and I had I was really lucky. I was young in Q2 back then, so I had a lot of opportunities to <laughs> jump and dive. I was leading expeditions, diving expeditions, and I witnessed the dissemination. Like, I used to profit from taking divers down to see hammerhead charts, hundreds. Tourism uh, flew to Baja, Mexico, to from all over the world to see these schools of hammerheads that would, underwater, would get dark with so many hammerheads. And I loved them. It was just fascinating and exciting from seeing them gone. They haven't been able to repopulate. So I worked then in conservation as a nonprofit to protect sharks in Mexico. It was the first one in Latin America, in fact. And it was very frustrating working with policy to create a lot of stress for me. Um, it was like hitting walls. It's a little bit like getting permits that you're going through for your businesses. Like, whoa, no, sharks are doing perfectly fine. So um, that's a problem all over the world, overfishing of many species. So I saw that with lobsters when I worked in Japan, the fishery, and so many problems I worked. I did my master's in Scotland and at Shetland Islands. I worked in um, oil spills, analyzing data, venting communities from, from oil spills. And, and no, 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 and I, I think I hit a point where I am, um, combination of progesterone and having children decided that <laughs> I think my best effort should be in educating the younger generations because changing adults was wearing me off and it wasn't going anywhere very fast and I was never been very patient. So for me, education is kind of the mesh, like a fishing net that you put everything inside to hold, so to engage we use a variety of the major foundation of strategies and tools, a toolbox, depending on the audience, and you have to tailor them depending on the audience and the stakeholder. Uh, some things work better for some, like if it's educators, we'll bring them in, if formal or informal, what is that they need. So evaluating what you do constantly is important to understand and engage with communities and listening what is that they don't know and would they want to know to make their life better or just becoming more ocean literate that's i think key that if everybody knew like the things we said yesterday about how these baselines are shifting if they can see what it used to be and is now but most importantly how much we're going to lose if we keep going the way we're going so the majority of people in the world don't know that 70 to 90 percent of the oxygen is produced by phytoplankton and algae. If we all knew of that in the world, that's something that's just like as basic as, as we know um, that, I don't know, one plus one is true, right? But most people don't know. So for me, for us, what we do is the way to engage them is understanding your audience first and then see from your toolbox what tools are going to be work to engage that community or that audience um, and fill up the gaps and the needs instead of going chasing for the money that's available, might not be available, what's trendy. Uh, fill up those gaps 
what is that they don't have that they need to be there to take part to make informed decisions and i think another opportunity um on the topic of world oceans day we're kind of on a world oceans day world tour right here the three of us uh, can you uh, let the folks know another opportunity this weekend that they could come and maybe connect and get yes, engaged with? thank you. Yes, so I'm really happy that we have this forum because or go a step back is Earth Day, Earth Day, Earth Day. I mean, since 1969, right? We're hugging trees, but like I said, most of our oxygen is produced in the ocean, so it is 76, 73 percent of the planet. So celebrating for Oceans Day should be as important as celebrating Earth Day. So thank you for having this forum, and I invite you, thanks to Puerto Wanimi, we have an event next Saturday, which is day after tomorrow, at Harbor Cove, across from the Shenandoah National Park Service in Ventura Harbor, celebrating World Oceans Day. So it'll be a community with live music, the Shenandoah National Marine Sanctuary Superintendent. Uh, we'll be at keynote speaker, Chris Mobley, and his band, live music, and we're going to have ocean trivias, a lot of education booths, uh, and there's going to be an, a race, an outrigger race happening at the same time. So they'll have beer garden and food. Uh, we're going to have a lot of uh, games, a big beach cleanup goes to Keepers, uh, is one of our main partners, and they'll lead a uh, beach cleanup. So from 11 in the morning to 5 p.m. Please join us. both of you and your organizations do really, really well is um, what you kind of spoke on is, is getting folks to understand the importance of like this, this topic of eco-literacy, you know, as you were sharing, you know, we all kind of know how to, uh, you know, count to two, tie our shoes, you know, our address and our phone number when we're about, you know, five to seven years old, but, you know, we don't have a really good understanding of like our ecological address, you know, we didn't know this was a marine protected area or, or a lot of the things that Sean Hastings just rattle off to us, right? Like that the whales come here, that there's 52 of them, you know, there's just so much rich biodiversity and, and, and indigenous history here, right here in Ventura County. And I think um, the two of you and your organizations do a really, really good job of highlighting that and allowing it to be, um, how do you say, um, kind of welcoming. You know, I, I, I can't think of a time where uh, I didn't feel welcomed by, by each of you. And I know Maripasi had a couple of slides and uh, the title slide, um, if we can pull it up, it was the one that shared, I think it was Para el Mar y el Mundo? Yeah, so uh, the Oxlade Para el Mundo. Um, you know how I was mentioning in the beginning, typically in the environmental field, environmental conservation movements, you don't typically see people who are brown, right? And so, like how Adam was mentioning, there's all of this eco-literacy, eco-engagement that's out there, but sometimes in our own communities, like Oxnard, kids, even young adults, even old, everyone, no matter your, what your age is, we don't really have access to that. I myself can say that I, I learned a lot today. Um, I was had my little notepad, um, and even with my degree in environmental science, which is only a bachelor's, you know, baseline, I didn't feel like I really had that much knowledge on it. So whenever I get these opportunities to go to educational, you know, summits or forums, right, um, I really try to make the most out of it. And not just for myself, but for my community, right? Um, when our volunteers come, we really want them to engage with us, right? Um, you know, one of our focal points for our organization is beach cleanups, right? Um, how many of y'all, by a show of hands, have gone to at least one beach cleanup in your life? Okay, the, almost the entire room, right? But we're trying to change that narrative of like, here's your bucket, here's your stick, here's a pair of gloves, go pick up trash, come back, and that's it, right? We want to create relationships where a lot of our volunteers from the past three years keep coming back because we look like them, we reflect the community, and because we try to have meaningful engagement and conversations with them, right? I love it when I see families from South Oxnard who, you know, keep coming back. I know who their kids are, their kids are so excited. They love it when we give them a sticker, right? They have all these questions about 
Um, you know, what is what is that big power plant? Why is there steam coming out of it? You know, oh, what's this bird? You know, this is, you know, Great Blue Aeron, you know, Egret, you know, things like that. So it's all about fostering this welcoming environment for our community that sometimes don't really get those opportunities, but thankfully we have organizations like Merito that goes into schools, takes kids out uh, to the islands, helps teachers as well become those pipelines for eco-education, eco-literacy. Um, and so, yeah. I'm gonna give you this. <laughs> run the show from here on out. Yeah, and so, you know, I can't just come up here and, you know, just talk about my own journey. I really want to highlight my organization, our organization, Coastal Keepers. And so this is typically a slideshow that we show when we go to schools or we meet with stakeholders. And so we like to title it, De Oxan para el Mundo. And so, basically, you know, our whole organization is funded, or not funded, um, is focused around uh, picking up trash, right? This it's the first milestone we're, you know, trying to level up as we go. But, you know, the issues that we see in our local beaches, specifically Orman, Wainimi Beach, is that there's a lot of trash, right? How many of you have gone to the beach and have seen at least one piece of trash by like a raise of hand, right? I think everyone has seen a piece of trash at the beach, right? And so the other thing that's going on too, I apologize if this map is a little bit blurry, but there's mass industrialization and pollution of our coasts, right? Why is it that communities like Oxnard and Wainimi, why do we have to bear the burden of industrialization from these power plants, from these recycling centers, um, from these massive corporations, and you know, not other communities in the county, you know? So we try to, you know, focus aside from beach cleanups you know, on the issues that, uh, you know, have been here for years and trying to make our own impact on them. So like, as I mentioned, um, Coastal Keepers started in late December, 2020, and we're a action-based grassroots organization of first-generation Oxnard Port Wainimi natives. And we're all rooted in, you know, bringing awareness to local uh, social and environmental justices, right? And so our why? You know, why, why did we do this? Why do we continue to do this every day? Why do we continue to meet up and try to find solutions to our, you know, coastal environment? It's because we really want to connect the communities to the coast. Um, not only that, but we really want to protect them and restore them. Um, you know, and the way we want to do that is through coastal cleanups, education, and community engagement. And all of this work is centered around our four our five values that are listed below, right? Comunidad, creatividad, conciencia, cultura y corazón, right? Community, creativity, uh, consciousness, culture, and heart, right? We're not just doing this work just because, you know, we're trying to have a good time at the beach, which we are, which is a part of it, but we really wanted to have a meaningful impact on our community and on the ecosystem. Um, and so, how many of you are familiar with Borman Beach, the wetlands, the lagoon? Okay, a number, okay, a couple of us, all right, right? And so, there's a lot of significance in that area, you know? Um, it's home to over 200 species of rare, diverse wildlife. It also acts as a flood control um, when we get those big storms. Um, the federally threatened western snowy plover also calls this home, you know, that cute little bird that Disney made the short of. Um, is also our logo, um, but you know, like I was mentioning earlier, there's this decreased habitat and pollution, um, and increased pollution that has you know threatened this area because of industrialization, and you know this place also holds a lot of significance for um, education, culture, and community. Right, Orman Beach, Orman the the lagoon can be a great access point for our South Oxnard Wainimi's community to go out and learn about all these, you know, significant things that, you know, this piece of land holds, right? And, and that's something that we really want to focus on. And so um, one quote that we really like to, um, you know, center our work around is by uh, John C. Lewis, a civil rights activist. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? 
right? We really want to take that action to, you know, not just do these beach cleanups, but educate our community, interact with stakeholders. Um, and this is just what a typical coastal cleaner, uh, coastal keepers beach cleanup looks like, right? Um, in the lagoon, we found like a mini, uh, I guess you can say, uh, what is that called? A jet ski. Jet ski. Yeah, there you go. We found a mini jet ski in the lagoon. Um, you know, we find mattresses, we find all sorts of things, right? But it's all about our community coming together to help blow this away. Thankfully, we've been able to engage with, you know, our local officials with helping us with getting, you know, bigger dumpsters, opening up, you know, parking lots for our community to have better access to us, and yeah. And so because of that engagement with our local stakeholders, we have, you know, been graciously um, offered the Earth Day Proclamation in uh, 2021 and most recently in 2023. And because of that, you know, we're able to see that our work is very dignifying, not just for us, but our, for our community, right? None of this work, none of these proclamations wouldn't be possible without the help and engagement of our volunteers. Yes, and, and there's Adam, <laughs> proud member of Coastal Keepers. Um, and yeah, with that, you know, our vision and goals, um, you know, we want to see a reduction of single-use plastics in our beaches, waterways, and neighborhoods, um, restore and improve accessibility to Ormond uh, for current and future generations, and we really want to focus on educating and empowering our community, right? Um, educational pipeline is so important to us. A lot of us work. Um, in the educational sector, I myself do, so I, I know the importance of what education and engagement does to someone. And, you know, it just doesn't, you know, it just shouldn't stop at coming to a beach cleanup one time a year. It has to do with, you know, creating that curriculum uh, for kids as small as, you know, preschool all the way up to, you know, um, higher education and continuing to push uh, for, you know, environmental education in all those areas. Um, and then, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, if, if you're interested in, you know, keeping up with us, you can follow us at Coastal Keepers on Instagram. And if you have any questions, or if yourself, you're an educator and looking for a presentation, uh, we love going to school. So please feel free to email, email us as well. Thank you, Boston. And you really hit it square on the head as far as like the importance of like education and educating at all levels and this one's for Rocio. How, how do you how useful is education oh can we can we fire up those slides the next next set there we go so i think this will help us answer that question you know how useful is it as a tool for ocean resource protection and i should mention this i um the Military Foundation acronym for Multicultural Education for Resource Issues Planning in Oceans Initiative is a foundation now since 2014, and if you go on the next slide, that built upon a program called Medita also that I adapted for Channel Island Natural Marine Sanctuary in 2005. So what we're doing now is, is 18 years of work here, plus other five from Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So it's a national check on the strength initiative that um, it, it ran across from Monterey County all the way to Ventura County. Two national marine sanctuaries worked on it. I was um, I had moved from Mexico less than two years before I was hired to adapt it to this region. Um, it different. It was a program. Now we have multiple programs. The story is that. There was some funding during the recession, 2008 to 10. It was going to die. It actually ceased died in Monterey and Salinas County and um, was the next county? Well, three counties. And what is it? No, I think probably yes. So I asked. I flew myself in and talked to the ambassador, the then director. So I used to work with John Hastings. I'm saying so. I basically, support, uh, but we're part of the family, and that's why Chris Mullen is our keynote speaker next Saturday. Um, so we built on a lot of best practices from NOAA, a lot of many, many, many years of experiences, and I worked. So that's why I can access a lot of toolboxes, too. Um, so I want to say that I want to take credit for everything. I 
came and learned a lot from Noah. And in fact, I was hired by them to take a lot of these experiences to MPAs in Indonesia, Costa Rica, and Korea. So I'm gonna show you some of those tools or how the work, education works. So I'm show you on the next slides, talks a little bit about our mission, we're 501c3, based in 2014, but now you know that grew upon an existing program. And our mission is to protect the ocean by providing transformative experiences to multicultural youth in their communities, uh, in environmental education, ocean education, but also in hands-on research, so citizen science, marine conservation, such as habitat restoration, entrepreneurship, and advocacy, um, and recreation. So in a nutshell, those are some of the strategies because everybody trying to get to the heart of different people is different depending where we are, the personalities and the age. Some, like the kids we took camping yesterday, is that idea of taking them to the islands and being immersed at Santa Cruz Island and taking them snorkeling, kayaking, camping, enjoying, and giving the opportunities those that had never had them before because not everybody can afford it. And we're multicultural education because I'm born and raised in Mexico, you know, but I don't care whether people are uh, skin color or language or culture, as long as there's a gap, a need, and they didn't have that experience or they don't have those resources, that's what we need to fill in. But it is the truth that the environmental field has is very monochromatic. So when I came to the United States, I was like, 34. And I was like, I'm an ocean girlfriend. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're Mexican. You can't. What would it be? So I took it at heart to make sure that kids had experiences in what is scientific research that could see that is their possibility, or in marine conservation, or entrepreneurship in the blue economy, that everybody could have a seat on the table and decision making as well. So, and I did a lot of research and its assessments and over and over and OA supported my work in research when I developed the Manitoba Academy program for the Santa Barbara and Ventura counties and the needs of socioeconomic for the most part. And some language, but a much, much, much smaller percentage. So in the toolbox that you show in the next slides, I'll show you the addresses, the issues addressed back when I worked for NOAA at Monterey were very much urban runoff. And I'm like, oh no, uh, because of the experiences I had, like, so I was able to bring and address other issues like climate change, oceanification, plastic pollution, and loss of coastal habitats. In fact, General and Natural Marine Sanctuary allowed me to create the first lesson plan that NOAA had on oceanification. It's called Marina Stuporos, it's really cool. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's been many years, so we had the tools, if you show the next slide, are the development of our audience, identifying audience, understanding what are those constraints, what are those gaps, what are those needs. So we work with educators, because we tool them, that way we reach to many, many more students and perpetuate the effort, the knowledge, so by building capacity and educators, we are ensuring that the next the next school year, there'll be educated kids where ocean science, ocean literacy, environment, climate literacy, environmental literacy concepts and principles are embedded in their instru instructional plan. Just like they embed English, if they're teaching English language, they have use this lesson plan. And it's a story of whales, for instance, blue whales or different whales, um, the natural history, or it could be teaching math. And oh, here's how you can teach about tides, understanding tides and how tides work in the lunar cycle, or, or uh, shipwreck. How do, we, how do you learn latitude and longitude? So that's what we do. So that's the core of what we do. Um, and then if needed, they need to be in Spanish, then we make them in Spanish. So our, our curricula is usually bilingual for the students, not so much for the educators. So the next slide, please. Oh, I intro? Okay, let's see. So, here. Oh, yeah. Okay, here's the four, basically four strategies. is a curriculum and, 
and, and capacity building of educators, then getting the kids outdoors for recreation, environmental education, have the give them experiences in environmental monitoring or scientific research, and then green entrepreneurship uh, and uh, leadership and advocacy. And I'm excited, we're starting a new collaboration with Sierra Club, who are really big and strong for many, many, many generations on app, precisely that. And that's why they put it next to us on Shadow Lakers. So we're just starting that. So um, everything we do, we work with partners. We would not be able to do a fraction. Working with Port Wainimi, with museums, with with Koana, with um, Jack Michel Cousteau has been one of the keynote speakers with whoever wants to work with us, coastal keepers. It's it takes a, a village, right, to raise a village. So um, it's just an example of our curricula, lesson plans that are, meet the standards that the teachers need to teach so that they can use them. Otherwise, they they, they have to be able to do their job. Um, and we take them on field trips to or trainings. The teachers like that. Picture in the middle is a NOAA's research vessel. So we take the teachers once or twice a year so they go out and interact with scientists like Sean or his colleagues or from, uh, we have from, we work closely with Venture for Water, with City of Oxnard right now, uh, Public Works. We have a project, a program called Oxnard Verification, which is to involve the kids to restore community parks to um, reduce litter and urban runoff. We have another program with uh, UC Davis called VRAN, and here's some examples. This ATSI program from the Avenue, which is the, um, a, a disadvantaged community in Ventura, is all, all six, seven acres just for three years through an outdoor equity grant. We take them to Santa Cruz Island, sailing, surfing next week, if anybody wants to go with us, so we have two surfing and marine science um, programs on Monday and Tuesday. And we could always use help, always, always, always need chaperones. <laughs> um, this program uh, is uh, working with uh, City of Ventura and um, biking from the Anson School to Ventura River. We take them to Matilica Dam, uh, nature photography, restoration with state parks. And we have a cohort of about 12 stu students, middle schools who are stewards. You, if you go to Harbor Cole, you'll meet them and they'll, they'll educate you about ocean protection now. After. So that's just some of our examples of different activities out in the field on, on scientific research. We work with Ventura Land Trust, uh, Santa Barbara Channel Keepers, Surf Rider, Paul Jenkins on monitoring the Ventura River and advocate for the removal of the Matilica Dam, which is holding 800,000 uh, tons of sand and sediment that we need at the beaches, especially now when the sea level is, uh, rise is exacerbated. Um, so that's uh, the kids produce projects. Uh, we collect the data and put it on different databases. There are national, regional, or international, such as Ebert for Cornell Bank, or the NOAA Marine Debris, or NOAA Long Term Monitoring for Sandy Beach and Rocking to Title. So the kids are actually scientists when they go on the field with us. Um, this is a great example project we had during the pandemic. We were one of the few organizations working with kids in the after school. Kids and their parents, especially, we were going crazy because the kids are home all day. So we created a marine science camp and work with state parks at Buenaventura to restore three acres of wetland by the Ventura Pier. And people drove their kids all the way from Moore Park. And we had scholarships for kids who, um, mostly from Oxnard, who wouldn't have afford to pay for a summer camp like that. It wasn't summer camp, it was a after school camp. And then entrepreneurship, we challenged the kids for the eighth year in a row to create uh, proposals to reduce the carbon footprint of their schools. And we prices, we have disbursed up to next week, no, actually this week. I don't know how, tomorrow I have to deliver the checks to 75 kids uh, within their schools for the prizes, cash prizes. They competed, Adam was and Rodrigo from uh, Port Wainimi were judges, 
in elaborating proposals with budgets that reduce the utilities costs in, in electricity, reduction of water or waste production um, to make their schools more green. And the challenges are for the schools to actually implement the students' projects, and we're still working on that. Uh, here's them making the audits, waste audit. About 60% of the food of public schools throughout California is wasted. And talk about methane, and greenhouse gas production. Um, electricity bill in most public schools would work and work a lot is between twelve to twenty-two thousand dollars a month. So I think a year after year, and the kids come with great solutions like why don't we use reusable trays or why don't we put solar panels and they do their budgets and they present it and they get their patch. I can't. I wish I'd make the schools make those changes. I'm still working. So if any politicians in the room, that's something you could do. Schools have a huge carbon footprint throughout the world. But in California, I mean, the most progressive state of the United States or the most progressive country in the world, that's, I, that's shocking. And that's one thing I have been working for many years and I still struggle with. Tasteful of Exploration, a project we had sponsored by National Geographic last year. We hosted the project here, actually, the end. Right, Audrey? Yes, the kids, we gave them the tools, we were trained, then we trained the kids, the teachers, how to do storytelling, digital storytelling about addressing issues such as the pollution of Ormond Beach, and they created beautiful projects. That was just breathtaking. We did it right here at uh, for World Social Day. So anyway, that's our year's, uh, a year's track record. We do a lot of evaluation, pre-post for students, cognitively, behavioral-wise, because our 95% of our funding is from grants. I'm a terrible fundraiser. So please, if you know how to fundraise, teach me. So there's that grants, because I'm aging, writing so many grants. Very quickly, we're all aging, but so some of our partners, State Parks, Ventura County Office of Education, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Maritime Museum, sort of class, call upon reserve, UC grant. Um, we welcome help, and that's a really small funding. But here's my email if you have any questions. And how do we engage? Yeah, I know, I still, I'm still learning how to engage. <laughs> well, no, and, and before I open it up to questions, I was, I was gonna ask the two of you, um, what have you seen by working with youth in our communities? What, are, what, what do they want? You know, what's really drawing them to ocean protection? You know, what was it that like ignites them, catalyzes them, gets them to act? So if you might yeah. <laughs> um, I think, you know, what we really see out in our beach cleanups is kids, I'm sure all of you have know this, but kids have a lot of questions, right? And sometimes we don't have all the answers, right? And with a group like Coastal Keepers, all of us, you know, we're, you know, avid learners. We're still trying to learn a lot. Um, and you know, a lot of these kids just want to know the basic, and they want a basic answer to a really complicated question. Like, let's say, you know, the Helico EPA Superfund site, right? Kid comes up, he's like, why is there this concrete mountain over there? And I'm just like, well, I, <laughs> I don't know how to explain this to you in terms of like an eight year old would comprehend, right? And so I think it always goes back to education and literacy, right? Education literacy. And, you know, they there's there's this need and this want from these kids. Maybe, like, maybe they don't verbally say it outright that they want to know more about the environment, but that want and need is there from them, right? They always have these questions about like, oh, what's in the water? What's a lagoon? What's a wetland, right? Um, and so kids really want to learn about the environment and how they can contribute to these issues that we have, even if they don't outrightly say it. And so I think, you know, that's really what we need to do ourselves or individually as a collective, as a group, right? In any way that we're capable of is trying to advocate and implement these forms of education and outreach for our kids because, you know, we can try our best, but one day we won't be here. And if we're able to pass along these tools to these younger than generations, then, you know, maybe hopefully one day we'll have a, uh, an answer to some of these problems. 
And I think something that, that Coastal Keepers does really well is, like you said, it's a, it's a collective. So you have a lot of different subject matter experts that are all members that all come to a cleanup. And if one of you can't answer the question, there's usually someone in the group that has a, a certain lens to look at it through, whether they're an artist, whether they're an academic, whether they're just, you know, like a person that's lived longer than the most of us and just have that lived experience and can give us a, a simple answer to kind of a complex question. So I think that's something that I've seen, you know, I've, I've, I've experienced um, just showing up to a beach cleanup. You never know who will be there. And I think it's really, really special to, to have that opportunity. And Rocio, talk about questions. You had 72 hours on an island with a bunch of kids. So <laughs> what are you, what are, what are you hearing? I love because I'm back to a kid. <laughs> I like it. I love phone, no email. <laughs> Nobody can find me. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's having that, uh, find a way to have that connection. But, I mean, we really take care of what we love, right? We take care of our families, right? And we care of our health. So, I think the gentleman, I forgot your name, but mentioned that's super important. So, more and more, the older I get, a little more smart maybe, is health. I'm making those connections with health. So, I tell the kids, don't bring those plastic bags, plastic bottles that are like super thin. I mean, they're, they really do dissolve. And that goes to your, and and it really hurts your hormonal system and, and educate them how microplastics are disruptors of endocrine our, our, our hormonal system it, it is it changes so with very simple words i said it really damages they produce cancer and tell the truth there's alternatives just get your water bottle that you can reuse all the time you think your grandma was carrying those plastic bottles so they're like no okay so same thing you think your grandma had those Plastic bags every day, they got plastic bags at the supermarket? No, especially for us from Mexico, I'm like, no, we carry that mesh. So, and, and in reality, those making those references to their cultural, um, or, or cultural values or traditions really helps, at least, and I'm sure with you too. Um, it depends on the student. Yesterday, uh, a student, uh, he's, uh, he's not Latino, but he was asking really interesting questions who were at the island, right? And he was very interested in currents. So it really is, it's, you have to know your audiences and make those references to that person. So, um, but I think there's some things we all connect with, and it's one is health and recreation. Having fun is important. And, and also bringing the solutions and help them come up with them. Because if they talk about the doomsday and we're all going to die, we're all going to get sick, and they give up. They just give up. So one thing we really have to work together is that newer generations don't become um, apathetic. And they just can't deal with it because this generation has so much more stress than we had at their age. And it's really unfair. I think it's really unfair. It's like they are getting and receiving all these problems they didn't cause and they were born into it. So trying to find with them and make them the solution, uh, the innovators, the solution makers, resolvers, that they can have those critical thinking skills is super important. So going to beach cleanup and doing the beach cleanups is, is feeling I did something good. It's great. How can we prevent it? Period on using no plastics, not on the beach, not anywhere. Just changing how can you turn that around for us? A core challenge is why we create that project that, that a challenge where they have to come up with solutions and they get cash prizes or in kind like, like surf classes or something because there's a reward for doing something good for having a solution. It doesn't just stay in paper and it's a project I gotta create and that's it. If the schools implement their solutions, oh, it's a hundred times more value because then they believe that I can be an engineer or I can be a, many of them are not going to be um, engineers or scientists. We have to, we have to educate and engage everyone. We need the communicators, we need the attorneys. So we had a girl, not this trip, the previous trip camping in Santa Cruz, you know, after the, we're talking about adaptations and what do you want to study, and then she says, well, I, want to be an, I don't want to be a scientist, I don't want to be an engineer, I want to be an environmental attorney. 
I'm like, yes. <laughs> I think that's because we need policy. And we need politicians to make policy count and be effective throughout the world. So um, that's why I think we have to use a lot of tools from the toolbox mm -hmm. and be consistent and, and work together. Everybody has strength. I mean, the UCS is his strength and uh, the port is strength of the engineers. So work together while we're doing It's great. Thank you for both sharing with us today. And before I let you go, I just wanted to open it up to the audience. If there are any questions or comments or, or things you'd like to share. Well, in the last few days, I've been just uh, listening to the news. I saw the Suez Canal shut down with all the food. At a time of great crisis in food, uh, just from a sandstorm. I saw also a terrible situation in New York across the whole eastern seaboard with burning fires. There was a major fire following the fires there. And I, I, re, I relate to the knowledge and I relate to the, the intention of you going forward to try to change the situation. But there's something called hunger and appetite. I come out of the cinema world. And that's what we look at when we look at characters. And there's something called hunger and appetite. Do you have the appetite for what comes next? And are you willing to make the sacrifices in order to survive? Because I think you need a really rapid scenario. And I don't know how to do it except for Perhaps there are new tools that can make change agents that don't exist that can be used politically because they have a mnemonic uh, emphasis or, or it's a change agent that just like the myth of some spin off politically being used by a politician. But it's very real now. I can show you the death and the destruction and the cancer and the tomorrow that's perhaps uh, better than seeing it for real. Because for real, you're going to have to make the changes a whole lot faster. And there's some kind of rocket science here that's missing. There's a ratio change that has to be made in relation to the ratio of destruction and mercy. And you have to consider it. It's rocket science. It's calculus in this new game. And it has to be made in every area that you're working. That's what I see, just sitting back. Yeah, to, to double back on that comment, um, you know, Maritime, we're in a Maritime Museum, and talking about ships, I, Audrey could probably answer it better than myself, but like you said, to the the, the calculus and, and that, that, that golden ratio, I think back in the day, you know, before a ship could turn uh, on the, the rudder, it had like a very, very small piece that moved first, and that was called the trim tab. And to your point, you know, I think that's what the Rocio, Maripas and a lot of the, the folks that, you know, shared the stage here today, you know, it, it may not be, you know, the full rudder or the, the whole team of folks, you know, moving the oars in unison, but, you know, they're the, the, the first folks to just nudge that trim tab to cause the rest of the rudder and then the ship to take that, you know, of course, you know, ships don't turn on a dime and, you know, they can't, can't jackknife as fast as we'd like them to. But you know that was the, the the inspiration for for today's event, and that was the hope that you know we could bring uh, folks that you know we are in communication with can um, maybe be an arm's length away from. But just what, to, what government official wants to announce that you're going to have to reduce the amount of refrigeration you use daily, or by ten degrees, or by twenty degrees more warmth, and therefore shorten the cycle on the food you buy? And so that we can short, you know, so we can survive as a world because we need the refrigerators to stop doing what they're doing. That's the refrigerator. Forget the cars. You got to do something with all that. No, you're right, and it even ties into what Eric's doing, right? Well, it's, they, it's... They, well, they won't even talk about gun control. How are they going to talk about something like that and the economic consequences? And that's big systemic change. And to the food point, you know, what Eric's doing and trying to realign the agriculture and what Julie shared with us today. Uh, we live in California. There's something called the California cooler. You can dig down maybe 10, 15 feet and yes. 
There you go. So again, you know, we, we have the solutions. The people in this room are here. I want to thank Maripaz and Rocio for being with us today. And uh, thank you. Thank you all for Yeah, thank you so much. And with that, uh, thank you for coming out to the Port of Wainimi's inaugural World Oceans Day Sustaining the Sea Summit. Uh, before you leave, we want to make sure that you um, grab a little gift, a little thank you from us for coming, spending your time. If you want to speak to Mari Bas, Rocio, or any of the panelists here today, feel free to do so. And again, we thank you. We appreciate your participation. We look forward to doing this again. And you can reach out to myself, Giles, or any of the Port team here today, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.